my lady and my lords, I appear for the appellant in this matter. Uh, my learned friend, Mr. Richards, uh, King's Counsel, appears for the Secretary of State in this matter. Um, one preliminary matter that perhaps I ought to just double check with the court. I hope the court's received our supplementary skeleton drawing attention to the Supreme Court's judgment in Morgan, yes. which obviously we would submit is of some significance. Morgan, I'll come on to why in a moment. Um, uh, my Lords, uh, 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 factual background obviously does need, it, it is important because it's important to understand, because, it's, it, 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 because of the nature of the issues that arise, but it's not complex and I no. suspect the court is very familiar with it. We, we are, you can take it. Thank you. Shortly. Okay, I will do. Key point about it is, is that the applicant was released on licence and told that his licence would expire on the 2nd of July in 2020 unless revoked. And that's a starting point in terms of foreseeability. Well, isn't the starting point the sentence? When he was sentenced, he was told that if he committed further offences, he would be liable to have any licence period revoked. Uh, 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 well, the reason I'd, I'd, and perhaps I'd put it slightly, uh, well, there are obvious reasons probably why I might start at a different point, but probably the most, and this is where Morgan potentially comes into play. If the learned judge was correct to say that effectively foreseeability is simply about the sentence, then I completely see that is an important, that's the starting point. In fact, it may be the end point, and, yes. and, and that was obviously the focus of the judge. Yeah. What Morgan clarifies in our submission, applying Del Rio Prada, is that foreseeability doesn't simply apply to the, sent, to the sentence. It applies to the exit method of execution of the sentence. And that really is... is, is, is what in our submission is cricket. And that's why, in one sense, I started with my starting point. Because if one's looking at the execution of the sentence and, and, and what's relevant to that in my submission, what's relevant in terms of the recall is what he's led to believe about the way in which his sentence is being... Well, you'll, you'll no doubt take us to Morgan and make good that point. I will take you to, but I, I, it, it's just to, it, at this stage, just to explain yes, just why, if you like, my... That's why you started where you started. Where I start, I start where Thank I start, you. yes. Um, so we say, um, as I say, the starting point is he was told that he would be on licence until the, the, the 2nd of July 2020. There is then, in terms of foreseeability and what are the key facts, the meeting, and this is recorded by the judge, in uh, the judgment at paragraph 27, there is the meeting on the 31st of December where he has a conversation about the further offence that by this stage has been committed. He is told that recall is being considered. Um, and that's also part of the package in one sense in, in terms of what is ultimately foreseeable because at that stage, he's not being told recall is inevitable. He's being told that um, it, it's possible, effectively. We then know, obviously, that the license is revoked fairly soon after that. That's the 10th of January. 10th of January, exactly. That's 20, paragraph 28 of the judge's judgment. The applicant isn't informed of that, and he's not informed of that despite the fact that, as the judge records, policy provides essentially that there should have been a letter, or, or, or the policy on the face of it provided that there should have been a letter written uh, after the applicant had been unlawfully at large for 28 days. Yeah. You'll see that, that that... And who's responsible for that? The police, not Mr Haddo. I mean, uh, Mr Haddo could have told him, but who... Wh what's, which is the responsible body? The that police? would be the... Uh, no, I don't think it's the police, because it's a, it's a policy of the Secretary of State. We haven't included the policy in the bundle, but it's it's... Because it's a, um, a, a, a policy of the, it's the PPCS, which is the Public Protection Casework section, which is part of the part of the Ministry of Justice, rather. So it's the Ministry of Justice that would be responsible for that. Okay. Obviously, that. But we don't have the policy. 
we, we can provide the policy. I mean, but my learning friend and I, um, compliant with the practice direction, sought to edit down what was what we thought was required. But we can provide obviously anything that's that's missing. Because it because the, in, in one sense the key pe and the reason we didn't include it is that the key passage is included in the judgment that refers to the PPCS, explains who the PPCS are, and also includes the qualification that was that, that the judge was told about at paragraph eighteen. And the qualification that the judge was told about is that that letter, that sort of letter, is sent essentially only where someone is at risk of being prosecuted for being unlawfully at large. That, though, in terms of what is foreseeable, is it's not suggested that that was a that's a, pu a public um, practice. Um, and so, in terms of what was foreseeable, um, the policy itself saying essentially you'll get a letter if you've been unlawfully at large for 28 days, it would be a factor, factor to, to take into account in our submission. So, but that's, that's if you're at risk of prosecution for being unlawfully at large. What about simple revocation of license well, and recall to prison? Who, who is responsible for dealing with that? Well, it, it, or, is, it, or is that the same letter? It's the same, well, this is, this is the tension, sorry, I, I, I'm probably going through it for, quicker than I should do. This is the tension, in one sense, between what is said in the policy and then what is said at paragraph 18. The policy, on the face of it, doesn't distinguish between cases where someone is uh, uh, at risk of prosecution and someone who is not at risk of pros prosecution. And the judge accepted that at paragraph 18. So if, if, a, if, if someone who's reasonably informed were to look at the policy, the policy itself would suggest you get a letter from the Ministry of Justice if you've been unlawfully at large. The qualification is, is in paragraph 18, but that seems to be practice of the Ministry of right. Justice yeah. rather than what's set in, set in, uh, included in the policy. So that's why I was saying in terms of foreseeability, even though there's no suggestion that this is someone who was going to be prosecuted, in terms of foreseeability, the policy still seems to be in our submission of relevance. Right. So he, he gets no letter, gets no notification, uh, essentially, that he's unlawfully, unlawfully at large. No suggestion, though, that he's evasive. No suggestion that, for example, he's failed to provide correct contact details. And of course, probably more importantly in one sense, what then happens, and this is recorded by the judge, is that uh, contact resumes, essentially. Yeah. Um, supervision resumes. I mean, the, the, the judge summarizes that at paragraph 30 of the judgment, yeah. um, uh, making it clear that, that there was contact and uh, it's not suggested there was justification for the fact that there was contact without the appellant being told of his recall. The, the, I'll, I'll take you to it if need be, but it, it's, in, it's in the supplementary bundle. The witness statement of Mr. Haddo actually uses slightly different language because he talks about regular supervision. So it's quite clear that what's happening is the normal process of supervision, effectively. So from the prisoner's point of view, he's continuing to be treated as someone who's a, a, on license. That's the context, essentially, of what is recorded by the judge at Para 31 of the judgment, which is that Mr. Haddo, at the point, essentially, where the license would normally have come to an end, had there not been a recall, uh, uh, makes it clear, uh, or says, um, something, a lot, something to the effect that it's good news that your license is coming to an end. So from the, from the appellant's point of view, he knows that he's at risk of being recalled but he doesn't receive a letter saying he has in fact been recalled despite the policy. Instead, he continues to be supervised uh, and when his licence would normally have come to an end, he is then told that um, it, it, essentially it is coming to an end, that he, he'd completed his, his period of, 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 of licence. And so uh, Mrs Justice Williams correctly accepts that the appellant was led to believe, essentially, um, uh, uh, that, that his license would come to an end. That's paragraph 32. Yep. Uh, she finds there was no bad faith. Yep. 
uh, and obviously that is not a challenge that's uh, that not a finding that is challenged or could be challenged really um, but in our submission that isn't key and so what she finds is that it is obviously a, a complete surprise when the uh, appellant is subsequently detained he gets uh, and that's this is a, in one sense a secondary point but it, 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 it in a sense it it, 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 like the primary point, depends on what needs to be foreseeable. Except that he 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 is returned to prison, told that he's got 174 days left to serve, but he's given 58 days credit for the period he's um, uh, he was on license. Um, one final thing, just as a sort of a, 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 a reference, and I is that the probation notes themselves, as we make clear in our skeleton, and the reference. Again, I'm not sure I need to take you to it, is supplementary bundle, page 180, record the appellant as having completed his supervision. Now, I accept that doesn't directly go to foreseeability in the sense that it, 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 he, he's not aware of what's put on his notes, obviously. Indirectly, though, it's perhaps an indication, again, of what the, the key point that we're making, which is that the period of supervision is treated as a normal period of supervision. From the prisoner's point of view, it's all the indications are He's turning up for, to be supervised. As far he as had another suspended sentence, didn't he? Didn't he have a suspended sentence imposed on him by the magistrate before supervision recommenced? Um, he did. There was a sentence imposed. Sorry, yes. The, so, this, so, um, I'm just remembering what, what, what the sentence... Well, we don't know how long it was. We know it was suspended it, it for was two suspended. years. Yes, yes. It must, so have, been, it must, it must have been six months or less because yes. it was the magistrate. Yes, yes. yes. Yes, he did have a further sentence. And there was an unpaid work requirement. So yes. There was probation service involvement. Yes. So the, so the supervision is neutral, is it? Well, no, the supervision, he, because of the, not least because of the fact that the supervision, it, it comes to an end while he, uh, on the date he's told his, his primary sentence, for want of a better phrase, has been concluded. The, the supervision, he is... And, and it's not suggested he was being told essentially the supervision for, was for something else. He is the, 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 the clear implication is that he's led to believe that the supervision essentially is for the sentence in, for, for which he's being recalled. Not least, as I say, because of the fact he is told effectively um, on the date he's told he, he's initially told his license will expire. You've now completed your supervision. This is good news, effectively. So it, it, it all. And I don't think anyone suggested that, that, that effectively um, he was led to believe this supervision it was in relation to the new sentence. The, 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 I think, as I understand it, it was effectively accepted that the supervision was, was treated as being for the original sentence. Um, okay. And that's why, in my submission, the supervision is part of the foreseeability, because you've got this combination, at, at the risk of re repeating myself, you've got the combination of him to being told, your license will expire, on, in July 2020, yeah. he's not told, despite the policy, that he's being recalled, despite him having asked that he's being recalled. Instead, he is supervised as though the licence were continuing. And at the end of that period, he's told, well done, effectively paraphrasing, well done, you've come to an end of your sentence. Yeah. So okay. it's, it's all of that together. Mr Haddo looking at page 33 of the supplementary bundle, paragraph 12, says, I've since managed the claimant on the suspended sentence order on the sentenced in March 2020. Initial face-to-face -face appointment when he signed the induction paperwork. I conducted regular supervision contacts over the telephone with the claimant until his arrest in January 2021. But he's also... I mean, this is this is where it, the, the reference I was. If you go to para fifteen, yes, we, you've, you've already made that point. But you're seeking to suggest that there was some some clear indication. Right, we've now stopped supervising you on on the license. What on the on the face of Mr. Haddo's statement, he simply s resumed supervision once the suspended sentence order had been made. Um, and on the face of the evidence, um, it just continued until um, the appellant's arrest. Well, 
On the face of the evidence in my submission, what is, and this is the point I'm making, is that, 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 that what may well have been occurring is that there's supervision for two, to, for two offences. But the, for, the, for the primary, or the, the, the one that gives rise to this appeal, he is also being to, effectively being told he's supervised. That's why he's told uh, uh, in Para 15, your licence is coming to an end. And that's, I mean, it, 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 in one sense, perhaps the, 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 perhaps the, the key thing, because it's, it's not challenging, is, is that the, I mean, ultimately, in relation to foreseeability, the judge's approach um, in our submission is, if, and one sees this, I think it's a paragraph um, 89, was to say that the sentence was foreseeable, but the way in which he served the part of the sentence was not. So the judge on the face of it appears to accept effectively the, the, the submission being made, that it wasn't foreseeable that he'd been recalled. And that's consistent if you go back to para 32 para 32 the judge appears to accept that firstly the appellant hadn't been told about his recall but secondly he'd been positively led to believe that his license and sentence would come to an end on the previously stipulated date in July but there was no bad faith So that's so that so I mean the, that's why making the submissions that I am about the about about the, the first sentence on the face of it the first sentence the other sort of part of the background I probably need to just mention in passing is and, and again we can provide the copy of the policy if need be but. It, it, I think it's agreed, it's fully set out in the judge's reasoning, um, is that there was the policy then on, on credit for the period where the uh, appellant was um, unaware, essentially, uh, that he'd been recalled. And that is uh, Prison Service Instruction uh, 3 2015, uh, which is the relevant passages are set out or summarised at paragraphs 20 to 22 yeah. of the judge's judgment. Yeah. Um, Can I revert to one issue that my lady asked me about? I'm not sure we ever really got the answer. Um, on the face of it, it seems to me, the concept of recall implies that somebody is recalled which means, seems to imply that notifications. How can you be recalled if you're not called? Well, so was he recalled? As a matter of domestic law, and there's authority on this, um, and I don't think the parties dispute this, as a matter of domestic law, he is recalled. He doesn't have to be given notice, despite that language. Um, and I can't challenge that as a matter of domestic law. So as a matter how of... How is he, as, as a matter of practice, how is somebody normally recalled? Well, at the risk of giving evidence, but I think I've probably done this, <laughs> been in this... I mean, it, it, it sort of depends on how... Uh, uh, um, it, generally, what happens is that, um, in my experience, is that the public protection casework section, the PPCS, take the decision because it's ultimately a decision of the Secretary of State. And that must be, that must be recorded in writing? It's recorded in writing. Yes. Um, the police are then notified, and generally it happens very quickly that the police arrest the individual. So their notification effectively is in the form of the police coming to their, to their front door, arresting them, and they will be back in custody very quickly. And they're not sent a copy of the decision? 
Well, or, what happens... Or, or handed a copy of the cathedral? Under the legislation, if I remember rightly, as soon as they come back into custody, they are given a, decision, a copy of the reasons in writing for their recall and given a, a details of how they, how they can challenge that. But that is... That happens all... I mean... If the system's working properly, it's essentially a, an all-in-one package, if I can put it that way, where, where they, the decision is taken very quickly. The police are at the, front, at the individual's front door. The police hold them, hand them the notice. They're told about the reasons. They're told the, 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 how they challenge the recall. And, that's, that, it, and, and this is, I mean, I, 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 I think it's probably well known. I've, I've done quite a lot of prison law over my time. I don't think I've come across one in again, at the risk of giving evidence, but hopefully... Being, I don't think I've come across a case where someone's been at liberty for anything like this length of period of time. Was COVID a factor? I don't know, because we've got... No, because ultimately, the, 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 we, uh, ultimately the, the, the execution is obviously ha carried out by the police, and we yeah. don't have any evidence from the police as to what the, what, what, what the reasoning was. I mean, the, the notice of revocation is, in effect, for the police's purpose, a warrant to arrest X. Well, it, yes, I mean, because it, it provides them with authority to arrest it. Yes, I mean, as soon as as, as soon as a license is revoked by the Secretary of State, and that's necessary, then someone is technically unlawfully large; they yes. can be detained. Yes. Absolutely, my lord. Um, but and obviously, that's irrespective of whether they know about it or not. That's irrespective of whether they know about it or not. Yeah. As a matter of domestic, as, as a matter of domestic law, obviously, and that, in one sense, is 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 at the heart of this, this case whether that's compatible with the ECHR. I mean, it, 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 as I say, in the majority of cases, it probably doesn't matter in the sense that 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 nobody was. I don't think anyone would suggest you need to be given notice. A long time before you're recalled. So if, you, if 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 the police come to your door and say you've been recalled, here's the piece of paper, and you're it, it's it's difficult to see what the objection to that is. Save in this sort of situation where the person's been at liberty for a year. Are you going to take us to um, the my instructing solicitor who's who's joined us because of, he's in another jurisdiction remotely, has just WhatsApped me saying, and he will have more experience of this, saying, in fact, I'm wrong. The police don't provide the recall papers, but you do get, re there's a right to... Once you're in prison. Once you're in prison. It, I think it's, it must be in yeah. prison. Yeah. All right. So prison service policy three of 2015. Uh, yes, I just took you to the summary of it um, yes. uh, for the moment, because Paragraph I'll come 20. on to what... It, it, it's, a, it's a 20... Critical points about it are that um, it, 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 it obviously doesn't deal well, it doesn't deal with the circumstances of this case. It, it says effectively it's only in exceptional circumstances that you will get credit for the period you run lawfully at large. Um, and it's liable to be less than fifty percent. It's liable to be less than, except in very exceptional yeah. circumstances, un, undefined. Yeah. Um, uh, which uh, and, and and each case is considered on its merits. Each case is considered on its merits, okay. and the judge's approach. I mean, the judge's approach to both of these issues in my submission was to uh, focus essentially on the foreseeability of the sentence. Mm -hmm. um, if one looks at para. 89, and this was in the context of earlier findings, obviously, about bad faith. Yep. Para 89, looking at the sentence, um, the judge indicates that foreseeability is met by the fact of there being a sentence for 30 months, even if, and this is the critical point I drew attention to before, the particular manner in which he served was not foreseeable. Yep. And that's in one sense at the heart that's of this. The heart of the case. Um, and that also impacts on the um, uh, approach to policy, because if one goes to 96, 97, 98, you, you see there acceptance, essentially, the, the, of the, the arguments of my learned friend that... that um, uh, um, 
the Article 5.1 uh, obligation was met, uh, uh, and as I understand it, that's a reference back to the fact it was met by the sentence of imprisonment, effectively. By the way, I've just received another WhatsApp suggesting that, the, um, that COVID was probably unlikely to be a factor in the delay in this case, in part because there wasn't, there wasn't a, 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 an address provided um, and also um, it, there was the use of, I'm told, of an electronic tag and so his whereabouts would have been known so it's, it's, it, 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 his whereabouts weren't in dispute so it's difficult it's not necessarily the case that COVID would have been a factor <coughs> Can I then turn to the law? Firstly, in terms of the domestic law, there's probably not much I need to say about that, given what I've already indicated, which is that this isn't a challenge where we can rely on the provisions of domestic law. Two things, though, that I'd draw attention to. The first is that under the Criminal Justice Act, Section 254, um, which is in the authorities bundle at page 6, Um, the, by the way, so, the, 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 uh, having looked at 254, I thought it might be here. This contains the provision which um, I have sort of alluded to about the right to reasons for yeah. recall. It's section 2542B. Is but the he's reason. only entitled to it on his return to prison. On his return to prison, yeah. yes. Um, but section one, uh, the reason I draw attention to it is it's quite clearly discretionary. There's a dispute between the parties as to what test effectively the Secretary of State is required to, 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 to apply. In one sense, I, I don't really see why that needs to be resolved for, these, for the purposes of these proceedings. The point of the matter is there's discretion. If, if it was mandatory, effectively, to recall following a further offence, in terms of foreseeability, that obviously would be an answer to the case because it, the, the, the fact that the offence would, would, would have justified it. Here, consistent with what the uh, appellant was first told, there was a discretion, and so there was a decision to be made, and that's why he was correctly told initially that there'd been no decision. So, it, 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 from his point of view, that's the context in which his subsequent treatment uh, and what he subsequently told in July should be viewed. Yeah. He was tagged throughout this period, period of license. That's what my solicitor has just indicated, yes. Until the 2nd of July. Um, I have to say I hadn't picked this up from the papers, so I'm I'm he was waiting serving, to. So in every every possible sense, he was serving the sentence. Well, he was he it, it, certainly he was led to believe he was serving the sentence in a, in, well, in a legal every, sense. In every, in every factual sense, he was yeah. serving the sentence. Yeah. Well, that's and, and to, to an extent, that's obviously why he was given some a credit for for that. And I accept that. That's that that's a reflection of the fact. The reason. So, so when, so the tag, whatever happens, the tag would have cut, would have been removed in July. It must have, yes, yes. must have been. Yes, yes. Oh, did, did, or, why, no, why was why was the tag there? Was it a condition of bail for his appearance? I I have to say I hadn't picked this up, so I'm I'm relying on what I've been told by the person virtually behind me. It would I'm, be very unusual for a, a for a, a, a determinate sentence of this kind. Mm. For somebody to be subject to an electronic tag for 15 yeah, months. Yeah, yes. Well, I'm, I'm. I think I'd go so far as to say almost unknown. I'm. Yes. <coughs> the magistrates wouldn't have made it part of the condition of the suspension. Well, they didn't. No. Well, we don't know. Well, Can we I? Know that there was an unpaid work requirement. There's no there curfew requirement. No curfew. Yes, that sounds I, highly I, unlikely. Yes, can I, 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 I'm waiting for a WhatsApp from, from I'm, I'm looking, I, I have to say I hadn't picked that up from the papers and I'm relying on what I was told. Um, well, we'd need to have a little more foundation for that. Ah, I'm, the point that's being made, and I, I did suddenly wonder if this was the case, it was part of the suspended sentence, so it, because of course it can be a condition on the suspended sentence. So he was, My Lord just said there was no curfew requirement on the suspended sentence, there was just a work requirement. Well, that's the evidence we've got, anyway. That's what the evidence is. 
Yes, but 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 what I'm being told by by the person behind me is that it was it, that, that the condition was part of his suspended sentence. I can't point to any. Well, uh, well, there'll be a court order somewhere. Yes. No. I, 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 so can that be can that be found, please? Well, I'll, thank you. Yeah, I'll ask. In yes. any event, that that is a different sentence. That's the second sentence. I, 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 it's not relevant to the first sentence. No, I, 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 just be clear, I was just indicating, the, 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 I was answering in one sentence. But to my Lord's point, yes, he's yes. not serving yes. that sentence. No, I agree. Right. Well, the, the way in which he was potentially serving it was by being supervised, not by, by being tagged. Yes. Not by being tagged, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But it, I, I, I think the only reason I was relying on it was to indicate that there were ways in which he could be located effectively. Yeah. That, that's that's the point I was relying yeah. on it for. Um, the second point about domestic law is the reason, um, the, the authority that essentially uh, that is uh, one of the authorities, or the key authority that is essentially uh, relied upon that, 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 that leads to the conclusion essentially that, that there was no issue with domestic law is the, the judgment of this court in Ellerton, which is at page 79. <coughs> <coughs> and you, you'll see there it, it what was essentially the, the individual was unlawfully at large because there had been a mistaken release. Yeah. Um, a matter which the Court of Appeal indicated was grossly unfair. But the conclusion reached was still that he was unlawfully at large, and one sees that at paragraph 20. Yep. Um, there is brief reference to Article 5, but it, 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 it doesn't really assist because the position appears to have been um, at that stage that it was it was believed that Article 5 re reflected the common law, and that obviously isn't what is being said in this case. No. All right, so you can't rely on domestic law on its own. Yes. Uh, what I would just mention is that, I mean, with the, the language of grossly unfair, which is a, a paragraph 4, perhaps is part of the context in, in which this case should be uh, viewed. Uh, whatever the domestic law position is, we would submit that, that it is unfair for someone to be in the position of the uh, 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 appellant where he is told essentially that he is con uh, he's completed his sentence. As a result, he has no reason to believe he's at further risk of loss of liberty. Um, and then, out of the blue, is arrested. Key authority now, we would submit, because it is very recent, it considers the issues that arise in this case, and really, in one sense, concede that 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 that, that is that it is the strongest point in our argument is the judgment of the Supreme Court in Morgan. And Morgan is at tab uh, sorry page, tab three page eleven. Uh, of the bundle of authorities. Yeah. The issue in Morgan was, and it's an issue that arose from Northern Ireland but had also been considered earlier by the English Divisional Court in the case of Calm, were the release arrangements imposed by the Counterterrorism and Sentencing Act 2021. Yeah. And as the headnote makes clear, what, ha what the effect of that legislation was to delay significantly the release of determinate prisoners. So it's have, had a retroactive effect? Yes, it, it applied to prisoners who were already in custody, expecting, based on their, the combination really of their sentence and um, 
the, uh, uh, and the legislation that applied at the yeah. time of their sentence, that they would be released, into, in fact, if I remember rightly, at the halfway point. The legislation changed that for that group of prisoners as well as new prisoners, yes. effectively. So that's a sort of paradigm case for the foreseeability argument. It's a paradigm case, although ultimately, it, it, in Article 5 terms, and this is the critical point, it fails on the basis not that foreseeability didn't apply to that, but it fails on the basis that it was foreseeable that um, changes, might be, changes might, might be made, basically. So it, 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 it fails on the facts, essentially, as to what was foreseeable and what wasn't, rather than the principle. And you see that if you go to page 41 of the authorities... Paragraph 41, it, 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 a lot of the judgment is concerned with Article 7, and Article 7 obviously has no application, but, but it goes on to consider Article 5, and in particular, the judgment, I'll come to that in a moment, because uh, 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 it, 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 we do submit, obviously, uh, that it supports our arguments as well. It, it considers the judgment of the Grand Chamber of the European Court in Del Rio Prada. And paragraph 121 and 122, I ask the court to read. It's probably as easy for the court to read it. Some submissions about what it <coughs> illustrates. So paragraph 121 and 122 in our submission is, is, is key because it draws a distinction not reflected previously in domestic case law between Article 5 and Article 7. Article 7 is simply concerned with the, with, with the penalty. Article 5 is concerned with execution of sentence where liberty is in issue. And that's important here, because in our submission, and, and in particular what it, what, it, what it makes clear, sorry, I should say before going on to say what we say about the, our case, is it makes clear that the, the case law regarding, uh, or the, the standards that apply in relation to quality of law, apply to the execution of the sentence. And the quality of law... Um, Accessible, precise and foreseeable. Yeah, exactly, and that's made clear, para 98 is where the Court, the, the Supreme Court repeats what is, uh, uh, um, what is said about foreseeability. Now, on the facts, as I've already indicated, it, it, the, court, the Supreme Court then concludes that the change enacted with the new legislation, essentially, um, it, it, it was foreseeable. And they identify... Uh, um, a uh, number of factors which we would submit um, a, 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 and you see this at, at, at uh, para 127 and 100 um, but aren't, don't all those points apply equally in this case because the term of the sentence imposed is calculated without taking into account the early release provision so he gets a 30 month sentence the lawfulness is decided for the duration of the whole sentence. It's a 30-month sentence. The fact that he expects to be released on license and to remain on license doesn't affect the analysis that the determinate sentence provides legal authority for detention throughout the time. <coughs> and it's foreseeable that... Um, well, four, I suppose. Well, that, but that's the critical distinct, distinction. It's for the critical one. For the critical okay. distinction. Right. It's for, uh, it's power 127 and 128 is where the court looks at the foreseeability of the change. And this is the point, is the court is saying, consistent with what it says at power 121 and 122, that, that the change 
needed effectively to be foreseeable, but it was foreseeable for a number of reasons, including the fact that changes had occurred in the past and that um, uh, it, it was also going over the page, page 42, it was foreseeable that changes might need to be, be made in the future for, for good reasons of public policy, essentially. Now, there you see foreseeability in one sense being based on legitimate public interest concerns. Here, what you've got is a situation where on the judges finding there was no reason for, no good reason for... for, for, for there isn't a change here, is there? He, it's just there's been a, a, a very bad mistake. Well, there's been a, 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 a very bad... What's foreseeable? If you go back, it, it, the question here, in what, if, 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 execution, if execution needs to be foreseeable, in my submission, the question that the court needs to then ask itself is, in 2021, January 2021, where the, uh, applic uh, the appellant is detained, because that's when he loses his liberty, was it foreseeable, if he'd gone to, for example, take advice, was it foreseeable that he was potentially going to be detained? That's the question, because that's the execution. That's when the execution takes place. No, isn't it? Is it foreseeable that during the currency of the determinate custodial sentence that arrangements for the manner of execution will change? Well, they don't. There isn't a change. But all that happens is when he does commit the further offence that it is entirely foreseeable, renders him liable to um, recall, uh, it, it, he's not notified of it for unexplained and, and un, unfortunate reasons. But, well, but nothing's changed, has it? But, my lady, the, the use of the word change in my submission doesn't reflect paragraphs 121 and 122, in that paragraph 121 and 20, 122 indicate that what matters is whether or not, uh, and this is the language one sees, for example, in the last sentence in paragraph 121, is whether measures relating to the execution of the sentence are foreseeable. Mm. Now, the measures, the measure here yeah. was the detention in, in, in January 2022. Well, it's detention whenever, isn't it? Sorry, it's January 2021. Isn't it detention following committing a further offence? But, uh, well, you know, in, the se in this sense, in the sense that, 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 that if that, that, in one sense, is taking, uh, taking the case back or, 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 uh, um, uh, or focusing again on the, on the sentence. The sentence itself is... Uh, 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 quite clearly, one that produced, carried with it the potential for uh, recall if, if a further offence had been committed. But the execution, what, what we're talking about here in my submission is the execution. And by the time of the detention, was it foreseeable that, 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 that execution would involve detention? No, because, because, because of all the things that had subsequently happened. Okay. Can we just, just, just boil down what, what, what has actually happened that is said not to be foreseeable? Yes. It, it seems to me that what has happened here, it, it was foreseeable he would be recalled, and that that, that, could, that would lead to detention. detention. That's foreseeable. Is that foreseeable? What is not foreseeable, you would say, is that there, is that there will be a delay I put it slightly different, I, 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 and, and it, it, it may. One of the things that, and I'll come on to, I'll take you to Del Rio Prado in a minute. It is, it, it, it's important in my submission not just to focus on the point of time at which he is sentenced. Point of time at which he's sentenced. What's what's foreseeable there? It's foreseeable that he's subject to a a a a, 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 a regime of early release and recall, and the recall is possible if, for example, he. Reaches a, 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 his his sentence. By the time we get to um, 
January 2021. You've got the additional, the, the question there is, 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 is it foreseeable at that stage where he's effectively been positively told on the judge's findings that his sentence has come to an end, is it foreseeable at that stage that he will then be detained? And, and the focus is on detention because it's Article 5. That's what passages of Morgan makes clear. Is it foreseeable at that stage he will be detained? And in my submission, it's not. Because if he'd, for example, taken advice, an advisor would have said, we don't expect public officials to, 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 to tell you you've completed your sentence when you've not. You've been told you've completed your sentence. And that's, that's in one sense, the... the well, surely the professional advisor would say, "Well, we better just yes. we better just check, you know, with um, with the relevant authorities, the PPCS, whether whether any recall notice was ever uh, ever issued." Well, in my submission, that as opposed to a rather junior probation officer's say so. Well, which on one view was equivocal. But, 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 well, I mean, firstly, the judge appears to have accepted that what was foreseeable, what was not, in indicating that. And, and one of the reasons for that is, is that the, the advisor, I, I probably focused wrongly on simply what was said in July 2020. But you, you, that what was said in July 2020 was said in the context of continuing supervision, so continuing contact without arrest. But supervision in relation to the second sentence? Well, it seems to have been treated as both. But, but it was supervision in relation to the second but, sentence. But, but, it was, but, but, but also the absence of a letter. And you, so you had the public policy saying, we'll tell you if, we, if, if, if you're un, unlawfully at large for a, for a month. And, and that's also part of the context of that information. There's no, no, com, no communication saying... Is that more like a legitimate expectation argument than foreseeable? Foreseeability. Well, it, 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 the language of foreseeability is there because that's the language of the European Court of Human Rights. But, but it still has application in my sense, in my in my submission, because had, as I say, had had had, an, had anyone on the appellant side put their their mind to what actually happens is is obviously not the ca the, the question. It, the question is 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 what the objective standard uh, 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 or what the objective position was. Had anyone put their mind to it, the combination of matters that I've drawn attention to in my submission means that it, although in one sense linked linked reflects legitimate expectation, and that may be relevant for a reason I'll come to. But 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 but. The fact of the matter is, the, indivi the, 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 the individual would have thought, well, I've completed my sentence. I'm no longer at risk of being detained. Just one other point, which may not take me very far, but 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 it's just perhaps worth recording. I mean, it was put to me that if you an advisor um, uh, might have um, wanted to make inquiries, wanted to make inquiries. Of course, one of the problems with predicting that, and 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 and, and I mean. My submission is that the primary submission is that actually the advisor would have had plenty of material on which to, to advise. But if they had made inquiries, it's difficult to know what they would have would have asked for. But if, for example, they'd asked for um, uh, 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 they'd made a data protection act request, of course they would have seen the record saying we've completed your supervision. So it's not it, it's not necessarily one way in terms of what they would have un uncovered through that. Because that's obviously what the record that the record showed. Um, that I think deals with Morgan and why we say Morgan is important. Because Morgan, as I mean, 
Morgan makes it clear it's, it's not enough to just focus on the sentence, which the judge perhaps understandably did, given the state of the law. One does need to look at the foreseeability of the execution. Uh, and obviously we say the execution here was essentially the detention. And by the time the detention occurred, it, it wasn't foreseeable. Now, Morgan clearly uh, was decided on the basis of um, Del Rio Prada. Del Rio Prada is also in the bundle of authorities. It's a grand chamber decision. The background to Del Rio Prada, uh, it's at tab 11. I don't know whether you've got tabs, but it's tab 11 of the authorities. <coughs> and the background to it is set out in the grand chamber's judgment at um, 250 to 251. And essentially what had happened in that case... Page numbers. Sorry, two, two, the 250 of the, of the bundle pages, yes, yes. What had happened in that case, and one sees this paragraph 112, first, first eight lines of paragraph 112, paragraph 113, and then is, uh, is that Spanish prison authorities had calculated remission in a way that was uh, favourable to the prisoner mm -hmm. um, and had done that for a significant period of time. <coughs> the Supreme Court had then delivered a judgment departing from its previous case law and had required um, remission to be calculated in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, which effectively meant that the prisoner didn't get credit for their um, uh, 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 remission. Um, uh, and that totally changed the practice. Uh, um, previous practice, as is recorded at paragraph 113, had been different. And the uh, approach of the European Court, which uh, was to firstly find um, Power 117, which may be relevant to the, some of the questions I was asked a moment ago, that there was no reason, and sees that the second, it's sort of, it, 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 it's page 251, <coughs> the relevant passage, um, the sort of line five onwards, starting no with the word. No expectation of a change. No, no reason to believe, yes. no reason to believe with the language. And, you know, in one sense, that's, if you look at it, if you use that language here, did the applicant have any reason to believe that they were at risk of detention when they were walking down the street or wherever they were in, in January 2021? Our, re our submission would be they had no reason to believe that. Power 125 is where the court sets out uh, the well-known uh, sort of requirements of foreseeability. Um, uh, just really for the court's note. But the way in which the court then deals with this is at power 130 to uh, uh, 132. <coughs> yeah. And a couple of things I uh, draw attention to in relation to... I'll, I'll, I'll let the court read that and then make a couple of submissions. It's a breach of Article 7, but not, and not lawful in violation of Article 5. It, 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 the Del Rio Prado was both, both a breach of Article 7 and Article 5, but obviously we now know, following Morgan, that, that you can reach different conclusions regarding it. The, the fact we're not arguing for breach of Article 7 mm. doesn't mean that we can't rely on Article 5, because the, 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 the finding is that the the reasoning, effectively, or the, the, the approach is different. Uh, uh, the critical point, the, re the reason to draw attention to it is, firstly, 
because the language is slightly different, but, but not inconsistent in our submission with what is said in Morgan. The, the approach of the European Court, firstly, in power 130, is to look at foreseeability in application. And that's important in our submission, because that's really what we're talking about here, is, is, is was the application of the law regarding execution uh, uh, foreseeable? Secondly, when looking at that application, there was requirement for there to be essentially foreseeability through, throughout the subsequent the period of detention. So that's in my submission why I am entitled to point to um, uh, the particular situation in January 2021, albeit. Um, it, 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 in my submission, it's, it, 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 if you were to look at the time of sentence and, and say, is it foreseeable that you'll be told you've completed your sentence but then be recalled? Probably wasn't foreseeable because, because of the duties, essentially, of a public authority to, to act in a straightforward manner. But the, but the approach at 131 one see, is um, the departure of the case law the labor date of the release, etc., by nine years then, she has therefore served a longer term of imprisonment than she should have served in domestic education in force at the time of her conviction. It's the Article 7 that makes the Article 5. But, 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 but that, that's, that's what the facts of the case were. But of course, we know now, because this is what Morgan makes clear, that even though in her case, because there was in fact also a breach of Article 7, there was a problem in terms of what she was, what, what applied, the law as it applied at the time of sentence, that doesn't necessarily need to be the case for a breach of Article 5, because Article 5 is concerned with execution. But that is the basis for the Article 5 finding, isn't it? On its, on its facts, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's right, but... Morgan makes it clear it wouldn't necessarily have needed to be the case. I mean, it, 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 on the basis of, I'm trying to think of a, a, a this this appellant hasn't served any more, any longer sentence than he otherwise would have as a consequence of the delay. Well, because he wasn't in effect serving a sentence. If, if my lord's point had been right earlier on about the tag, yes. That might well change the picture, mightn't it? Well, as a matter of principle, no, I, I would you submit say no. 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 Okay. And the reason I say no is this, is because if, you, if con consistent with Del Rio Prada, consistent with Morgan, uh, uh, um, what has to be foreseeable is the method of execution or the, applic uh, 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 or the application of the law that applies. The, re the reality here is that um, by the time the, the application, but the, the by the time of um, uh, 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 um, recall, the applicant had been the appellant had been led to believe essentially the sentence had come to an end, and the sentence always had its own had limits within it. I mean, it was never. And it clearly could not, couldn't justify, for example, detention for life. I mean, it, had he properly, had he not been recalled, a decision after the end of his sentence to recall him would obviously be unlawful because there would be no power to do that. That would that would give rise to false imprisonment. So, the the the, 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 the so it's foreseeable that during the currency of his sentence, if he commits another offence, he's liable to be recalled. Yes. Uh, the expectation is it will all be done promptly and that there won't be a delay, but human nature such as it is, errors occur and there was a delay. Well, but it wasn't outside the bounds of lawfulness in terms of the sentence. He didn't serve a longer sentence. Well, it's different from Del Rio Prada, isn't it? It's very different. And it's different from Morgan. Well, it's, it, 
But actually, of course, I, I could... Yes, but I mean... But, 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 but you're, not, you're not in the, either of those situations. Well, in my submission, the correct way to look at it is, is to look at what the principles are. The principle is that the application... I mean, if you... But you're really never going to foresee every quirk and turn of, of fate. It's just not... That's not what foreseeability is about. It is foreseeable that if he commits another offence during the currency of his sentence, he will be recalled. What's not foreseeable is that there'll be a lengthy delay. That's very unfortunate. But is that what foreseeability is about? But, it's, but, but, but partly, and this goes back to the points I made about, about what is relevant to foreseeability, it's not just the fact of the lengthy delay. It is, it's the fact that he's effectively led to believe he's completed his sentence. And it's the fact... Well, you, you, you keep saying that, but it's really just an off-the-cuff remark from Mr. Haddo saying, well done, but what, was, what were the words? Um, good news, your licence is coming to an end. That's, that's what he says. But, it, but that's consistent with but, the fact that, that, that the licence was due to expire at that time. I mean, it's, if Mr. Haddo had said that in January 20... It wouldn't have necessarily had carried the same weight, but, but, it, but it's consistent with the fact that it was... The license was always due to expire at that time. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, and, and it's in the context also of, of the policy indicating that, that you, you're given notice essentially of recall. So when all of that is taken together, I mean, one couple of things I should say. I mean, you, you've put to me the, obviously the distinctions potentially between this case and Del Rio Prada, but Del Rio Prada, just to be clear was someone who'd received a sentence of 30 years imprisonment. So they were led to believe, effectively, they could potentially, that was the sentence they'd received, mm. if I remember rightly, they were led to believe that they could potentially serve the whole of the 30 years. They were then notified, essentially, that, that, that their remissions would reduce that sentence, and that was the notification they received. Be they believed that was a lawful way of, uh, of operating. Uh, of, of them having been calculated, and then the Supreme Court revisited that method of calculation. So, that, so if that's one of the reasons why, in my submission, Del Rio Prado demonstrates that execution matters, because if one simply looks at what the sentence potentially authorised, the sentence always authorised in Ms. Del Rio Prado's case thirty years imprisonment. What she didn't couldn't foresee was the fact that she would be told effectively you've got uh, you've been given this amount of remission and then the, and then the Supreme Court would change its mind now and you have to serve nine years more and you have to serve nine years more but the, but the in one sense a court revision, revising its jurisprudence is more foreseeable than a public of, a, a, a official effectively making a mistake, a mistake. Well, I mean, isn't it well, I, I would, I, I mean, it, it, I would use the language of misleading. I mean, it, it, I'm not saying in bad faith, but it was misleading. But we just, well, we'll have to go back to Article 5 here. The, the requirement is um, that it must be in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law. So that's the context. And 125 in Del Rio, which is cited by... Court in Morgan just before the paragraphs you took us to is looking entirely at the law and the procedure prescribed by law. And in both Del Rio and Morgan, what happened was there was a change in the procedure. And that's what wasn't foreseeable, or that was the question about whether it was foreseeable. This is a million miles from the question of when following a lawful procedure, if there is an administrative hiccup of some sort, does that bring us within this realm? But, but, but a couple of things I'd say about that. Firstly, just to put in context, the lawful the, the, the requirements of Article 5.1 require that detention should be in, in accordance with a procedure prescribed by law and require also that the detention be the lawful detention of a person after conviction by a competent court. Now, the, the, uh, that's the basis, that reference to lawful, if you go to power 125, yes. that is the quality of law 
point, and the, the it, that's where the the, the 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 court talks about the law being uh, precise and foreseeable. Yeah. Now, one of the di one of the <clears throat> one of the difficult in in our submission is that it, it, I mean. It, One of, the pro one, of the, one of the difficulties must be in our submission, one of the reasons why in our submission we can say that, 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 that this was unforeseeable is, in one sense, when does the, when, when it, how, lo how late, how long could this sort of uncertainty have gone on for? I mean, the, 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 if, 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 if I'm wrong in my arguments, prisoners who are um, supervised or former prisoners who are supervised on license can potentially be at risk of recall for an indefinite period. And although in this case there was the fact of a conviction, I accept obviously there was the conviction. Of course, you don't need a conviction to recall someone. You know, if 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 the if the prisoner, <clears throat> but that's dependent upon a recall being made, and then there being then there being a delay thereafter in effect. If it's not a recall, then there isn't a risk. But, 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 the, but the whole <coughs> factual basis of this is, of course, the prisoner doesn't know that there's been a recall because he doesn't know in this so case. The, the, problem here, the problem here isn't over the, isn't over the law or the procedure it lays down. It's over the execution of notification to the uh, prisoner of the fact that the recall has been made. Well, and that is not, that's nothing wrong with the law or the procedure. It's, it's a, an administrative hiccup. Well, except it is the law in the sense that the law, the, the law, it, 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 the question really is, is whether the law that provides for the execution of, of the sentence is effectively compatible with Article 5 if it's operated in the way that... that that it was in this case. Yeah, because I it just can't. It seems to me that you're, you're well outside the Article 5. The mm. question seems to me is was something done here, which is a matter of public law, gave your client a legitimate expectation that, he wouldn't, that the recall wouldn't be, wouldn't be um, effectuated? Um, but, there's, but there's nothing, in, there's nothing about, the, about the process which is contrary to the um, lawful process. And there was no change in the process. It was just that your client was told something by an official which might have led him to believe that he wasn't going to be recalled in circumstances where he might have had every expectation he would be. Well, except, as I say, by the time we get to 2021, in my submission, he, he, as the judge appeared to accept, he, he wouldn't um, have had a, a, any expectation he would be. But if he'd, if he'd put... And in circumstances where he didn't put his, have any expectation, it's probable he didn't put his mind to this. But if he'd put his mind to it, mm -hmm. the question I, I, he would have, my submission, he's entitled to um, ask effectively applying Article 5, is does the, does the law authorise my detention in these circumstances? In circumstances where I, 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 I've been told by the person who is responsible for my supervision that, 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 that I've been recalled, where I haven't had a letter which I would expect in accordance with policy saying I've been recalled. Um, and where there was no positive duty to recall me. And as I say, that, that, I mean, the, that there is a quality of law issue. I mean, if, if the judgment of the learned judge was correct. Prisoner who, I mean, give a hypothetical example of, of, to make the point I'm making. Prisoner, not this case, um, knows that they have a difficult relationship with their probation officer. There's been tension, there've been crosswords exchanged, things like that. Um, probation officer perhaps has said, look, I don't, take, I don't think you're taking this seriously, yeah? Prisoner then comes to the end of their sentence. It's told by the probation, uh, probation officer, you've concluded, you've now reached the end of your license, 
something, something like what Mr. Haddo says um, in this case. Prisoner is cautious, he's uncomfortable with the relationship. He goes to see his um, uh, uh, um, solicitor and say, am I at risk? You know, I've been told my license has come to an end, but am I actually at risk here? The, the reality is, if the court, if the, then the judge is correct, in one sense, the advice that has to be given is, I simply don't know. And that's, in, in my submission, inconsistent with foreseeability. And prison then probably reasonably says, well, is there a point at which I can be certain? I don't know. Because, because you know, as I say, it, 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 there's no real distinction. Had this, de had this detention occurred in January 2022 as opposed to January 2021, and the prisoner is at risk then for the rest of their life, uh, in one sense. Um, Can I ask, the, the, this notional person who's gone to his solicitor, yeah. why isn't the solicitor entitled, with the authority of this notional person, to ask the um, Public Protection Service, has there been a revocation of this licence? Well, and it's a public document. No? Well, it, 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 it would be... You could, you, you could certainly apply it under the Data Protection Act for, for, for the for, for papers. But you um, need to apply. Can't you write to them and say, what's the position? You don't have to go through a whole freedom of information exercise unless they refuse to, to answer. If they, if they may, why wouldn't they answer? Well, but the, in one sense, I, 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 it goes back to the point I drew attention to in relation to Del to Del Rio Prado, the approach about being, was there any reason to believe? I mean, in my submission, if you... If, it, it, you say there was no reason to There was no anything, reason to believe. But you're, you're posing a hypothetical prisoner who sits there not knowing and worrying and going to his solicitor. But, but the person, there is an organisation that knows the answer. Yeah. You don't suggest that they go to that organisation. Well, but... but, but <laughs> the, 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 maybe the hypothetical... I, I, Maybe the hypothetical doesn't help for, for that, but in one sense, the, the, the question that has to that, that, because the, I mean the hypothetical prisoner may not or ex offender may not exist in, in reality, but 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 the fact of the matter is that that, that, that you, you know, in my submission, what what the reference in Del Rio Prada to having any reason to believe means that is that people should be able to. Uh, um, feel a sense of security, effectively, about their liberty. I mean, it, 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 it would be so <coughs> odd if, if everyone at the meet at the end, having been told effectively you've come to the end of your license, then has to write saying, "Are you really sure that that, that, that that's true?" Um, well, if you've not committed any further offences, then you know you're okay. Well, you, but it's the fact that he has committed a further offence in in precisely the circumstances where he's liable to recall, but, but, as the but, court told him. But but but. but but, the, but that's the reason why I made the point about the, that within, in my hypothetical about it not being an offence. It's not the trigger is not simply an offence. It, 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 it's in this case there was there was the fact of an offence, but you can be recalled without an offence. Well, so you can, but this is this yes, case, yes. and this this appellant them. knew full well he committed another offence. But uh, well, he knew he'd committed another offence, but he knew about everything that then happened subsequently. Well, he knew what the judge had told him, doubtless, when he was sentenced. Reach the terms of your license, you'll be liable to be recalled, or words to that effect. Well, it, and he, what's more, he was given a copy of the license, which set it all out in black and white. It, yes, he said it, you'll be liable, but he, he I mean, it, the first thing he, one of the first things he does is say, am I being recalled? And at that point, he's told no decision's been made. Right. And he then, but that's then followed by the supervision, et cetera, and, and him being told, well, you've reached the end of your license. So, you know, it's not as though he was, you know, he, he hid the fact, for example, of his, his, his offence. He was, he was positively... Yeah, it is a sorry tale. It is a sorry tale. And, and that's, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I, I took you to the passages of the judge, and in one sense, the judge's findings are there. The judge doesn't, the judge is, is pretty clear in one sense that, that, that this wasn't, in, in her view... Um, slightly paraphrasing, but I think hopefully fairly paraphrasing that this wasn't foreseeable in terms of what happened. Um, yes, I mean foreseeable in a in a colloquial sense, 
or foreseeable legally. Because there is a difference, isn't there, as my Lord was putting to you, between what is foreseeable in terms of the procedure prescribed by law and the sorts of administrative errors and mistakes that are liable to occur, but, but one doesn't know when and where and what, with what impact. Well, but, the, but the procedure prescribed by law here was foreseeable. But, 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 but two things. Firstly, I, I repeat the answer I gave to my, uh, to my lord yes. about it's not just procedure prescribed by law. The, the, the passage of Del Rio Prada is clear. But we're looking not at interpreting Del Rio Prada. We're looking at applying Article 5. We're looking at, but, and but that is about the procedure. No, 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 it's isn't it? No, it's, it, it's, with respect, you, know, you but, have to be deprived of your liberty uh, in accordance with a procedure prescribed by law, and the deten the law for the lawful detention of a person. And if you if you well, go to, there's no question that there's lawful detention but, pursuant to a sentence imposed by a crown court here, isn't it? But well, isn't my lady, that? yes, because so, lawful. Is where, if you go to power 125, this is the point I've dealt with briefly. If you go to power 125 of Del Rio Prada, yes. you see there that the European Court makes it clear that the detention must be lawful, not that it's a procedure. It then. Well, lawful uh, in accordance with obligations that conform to the substantive and procedural rules of national law. Uh, uh, so but, there's no question here that this does conform with the substantive and procedural rules of na national law. What the problem is that there has been a an administrative mistake. Well, it goes on. Can, can I just ask you to read further on? Because that's, that lawfulness is where the quality of law uh, point is important. Yeah. Well, why don't we read on? Because yeah. it seems to me, um, when it comes to quality of law, it implies that where national law authorizes deprivation of liberty, it must be sufficiently accessible to provide foreseeable, etc. Standard of lawfulness requires that all law be sufficiently precise, etc. Where deprivation of liberty is considered essential, the domestic law is defined clearly. So it's all about the law. But it's not about it's not about it's not about whether or not somebody <coughs> a mistake may mean that somebody didn't foresee that, that that the law might be applied in slightly later than they might have expected. And that's, but, that's not what this is about. But well, a, a, a couple of things. Firstly, I, 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 at the risk of repeating myself, mm -hmm. I, I, I would not accept the characterisation of this simply being about delay because of the fact that there was positive information given essentially from the probation service and also but that wasn't that wasn't any, that information was any, wasn't any part of the, of the legal procedure being in question here was it well <laughs> mr haddo just just said that he he he, he was not a responsible official in relation to recall he made no decision in relation to recall He's just a junior probation officer. Well, he is the person responsible for supervising yes. the license. He would have... Um, well, he's supervising the uh, appellant on his second sentence. Well, uh, uh, in, in fact, but that's not the impression that's being given uh, uh, um, because of the fact he's saying you've come to the end of your license and he fills in the fort. Anyway, I interrupt. Him. Sorry. Yes. I, but, 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 but I... The, the, the quality, it, it, my point, the reason I took, took the court back to power 125 is the quality of law, yes, part of the issue is um, uh, 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 the requirement for a procedure, but what is made clear, um, because it talks about lawfulness of detention, including the question of a procedure uh, 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 prescribed by law, what's clear is that the quality of law context or, or requirements are broader. They're not simply about the procedure. They're about the substantive yeah. um, law. Yeah. The law which, I mean, the, the language used is that there has to be a national law that authorises detention of liberty, 
must be sufficiently accessible, precise, and foreseeable in application. And if you think about Del Rio Prada, Del Rio Prada, uh, which uses the language about application, was about application because the Spanish law didn't actually change. It, it, what happened was that the Spanish Supreme Court reached a different conclusion about what the law that had always applied yeah. meant. Yeah. So it was simply the foreseeability. It was the way in which the law was, as a result, unforeseeable in its application. Now, here, the law provided for... Was unforeseeable as to what the law was? Well, that's not the language of the... I mean, the European Court used, uses the language. I use the word application deliberately because that's the language in paragraph 130 of, of the European Court's judgment. So it's talking about the application of, of the law. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in Del Rio Prado, that may not have mattered whether it was the law or the application of the law. That, that, but that was the, the, the question the European Court asked itself. And here, it's, it, it, the question is the application of the law. The, 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 and the, the judge on her own, on the judge's findings, appeared to accept that it what the application wasn't wasn't foreseeable. Um, the, admin, the, the administrative application wasn't foreseeable, but not the but not the not the nature or interpretation of the law itself. Well, the the, the language. I mean, it, we, uh, uh, the language of the judgment where it refers to application doesn't seem on the, on the face of it to qualify uh, what type of application you're talking about. And in my submission, for good reason, because, it, because one's talking about the, 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 the liberty of the subject. Well, that's right. in, in Morgan, there is, a, there is a, a, a change in the procedure of quite dramatic consequence. Um, and that is held to uh, be um, foreseeable. Doesn't create an issue. Um, I, I thought the, the, the very, the very facts of Morgan demonstrate how very difficult your argument is. Yeah. And that, well, that's 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 that they're actually changing the, the procedure. So that the, as in um, as in Del Rio, but with a different outcome, but um, significantly longer will be served than might have been uh, expected at the time. But it was foreseeable there might be that change. Here, um, it was foreseeable, foreseeable that there might be a recall. Um, does the fact that the recall implementation was delayed through administrative inefficiency mean that the, there's a breach of Article 5? It seems very difficult to see that. Well, I think we, in one sense, we really run the risk <laughs> of going round and round in circles. But, but I, 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 all I would say, again, is that... It, In my submission, this is simply, it's not simply about delay. Um, yes, we've got that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's delay, Haddo, and the license coming to an end. Yes, it's a, yeah. it's a combination, yeah. a, a, and also the policy. And, and, and the policy. And the policy, the absence of a letter in accordance with the policy. It's, it, it's, the, it's the combination of those features. That, in one sense, is probably, well, it is, is the um, high point of my case. Um, I, uh, I mean, there are a few other points that I probably make, uh, but, but they're not, I accept, um, in one sense, um, uh, as important as the points I've just made. I mean, the first point I'd make is that uh, Del Rio Prada is, in our submission, um, uh, uh, um, consistent with um, uh, previous authority of the European Court of Human Rights. The, the basic statement about foreseeability, <coughs> which I took you to a moment ago, which talks about foreseeability in relation to the conditions of detention, um, uh, um, 
or rather the law that authorises the deprivation of liberty, uh, more accurately. Yep. Um, that is something that has obviously been uh, um, said in a number of previous judgments. If, if, if an example of is needed, that Khalifa, uh, which is in the authorities bundle at tab 15, yep. page 519, is an example. Secondly, it's also correct that the, the, the European Court has previously been concerned with foreseeability in execution, and we've cited in our authorities in our skeleton M and Germany as yeah. an example, but Del Rio Prada is probably the... Thirdly, in terms of foreseeability and, and sort of what that says about the relevance of bad faith, um, it is worth perhaps just turning briefly to James, <coughs> which is at tab 13 of the authorities, page 378. Yep. James in the United Kingdom, 378 is the relevant page. This predates Del Rio Prada. The key the Key paragraphs really um, at para, are paragraphs 191 to 193, where the court starts its review of the principles uh, that apply in relation to uh, Article 5.1. Yep. Um, in particular, five lines uh, into paragraph 191, making it clear that um, uh, the court has decline to uh, give an exhaustive list yep. of the circumstances. Meaning, in my submission, one has to be very careful about saying, well, this isn't the same set of facts as a previous case, because, because obviously it, what is more important is the principles. And the court goes on to indicate those principles should be applied flexibly. The, the real point, though, is that, the, the, and this goes to the judge's reliance on bad faith, power of 192 talks about how um, uh, detention has been found to be arbitrary where there's an element of bad faith or deception. A couple of things I'd emphasize about that. Firstly, it is clearly not saying it simply needs to be uh, bad faith. It is indicating that deception is also potentially significant. Um, and the use of the word element is perhaps it, 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 significant because it's not saying the use of the word element suggests that there needs to be some sort of flavor of deception or some sort of aspect of deception present. It's not necessarily the... Uh, but there must be some dishonesty or subterfuge, must it? And the, 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 mis, the, the, the fact that somebody is misled by a statement where there's no element of bad faith or dishonesty or subterfuge, surely, well, surely that, that is not sufficient to make it a well, the, 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 the contrast in, in our submission is between bad faith and deception, and uh, 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 because the, the European Court seems to regard them as different uh, factors. And in my submission, there is one of the difficulties in this, in a case like this, is that if you think about Mr. Haddo's evidence, Mr. Haddo accepts that uh, he decided, uh, and on the findings of the judge, for no good reason. He accepts he decided not to tell the uh, 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 appellant that uh, yep. he'd been recalled. He obviously accepts he positively said what he said in, in around ju July yep. the good, about good news. So there is, and I'll try and use neutral language to, 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 to there is a deliberate decision effectively to not give the full pe picture. Yep. Now, but that's different from a decision to deceive for some bad for some bad faith element reason. Is well, it's, 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 I'm not suggesting that the judge is wrong to find that there wasn't bad faith. My point is, is that what the European Court... But, you're, but they're not talking about innocent deceptions, are they? they? That isn't what makes it arbitrary. Well... They're talking about something that has an element of Dishonesty, subterfuge, bad faith, well, the, deliberate deception. The European Court, I mean, part of the problem is that the European Court, it, it doesn't say very much more than what it, well, it doesn't say anything more. But we, more. Can, we get the flavour, don't we? That, well, this isn't the, about an innocent 
statement that leads somebody to think something but, but, that is wrong. Except, I, 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 what I would say about the flavour is, firstly, it, it, by using the alternatives of bad faith or deception, the European Court is clearly indicating that that that, that it's um, that, 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 that there can be issues in circumstances where perhaps the highest threshold, the threshold of bad faith, is not met. Because, uh, as I say, it, 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 it well, this is not really this is not really looking at the situation of of deceiving the prisoner. That this is this is where the, the authority is is purporting to do one thing, but isn't but truly intending to do something else. Isn't it? Where they're, they're they're operating the system in bad faith. So, for example, they arrest somebody on one basis, uh, but, but intend, in fact, to extradite or deport them. So, that, so, the, so the, the intention in the first place is not for the genuine reason that was held out to be. Well, the, 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 the conquer example is slightly different, but I accept those are the examples given. But the European Court is making it quite clear that it's not, that the, 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 the list isn't, it effectively isn't closed in, in relation to. And all, all my point, the point I was going to make, the second point I was going to make about, about um, flavour, effectively, or, or is it links back in one sense to foreseeability, in the sense that why does bad faith or deception matter? In my submission, it, it, one of the reasons why it matters is, is because the law has to have that quality um, um, uh, um, the law has to have that quality of foreseeability, and if you if you deceive someone, you undermine foreseeability. Well, this is looking at something, as I understand it, you have all of the aspects of arbitrariness that we have looked at today, but this is this is, as it were, a um, a different category. This is a situation where the, where the, despite you, the complying with the letter of the national law, it's being used for a deceptive or fraudulent purpose, and that is, that is, uh, that is contrary to Article Five. I think to try and use this to say, well, it's not foreseeable that some point in the future, some government official will say something that's not entirely accurate. Really stretching it. No, I, I, I was. Point. I, I, well, I was possibly putting it the other way around, but, but, um, and, and it, the, the, it, in the sense, I was starting from the the idea that that, that, that that detention may be unlawful because it, it's arbitrary. And looking at what is meant by deception in this context, and indic and saying one of the reasons why, in, in my submission, deception has the has the meaning, I would argue for. Is because ultimately there is a need for law, law to be foreseeable, and so that there is a linkage between these two uh, uh, the, these two requirements to that extent. In the sense that wh why what's the objection essentially to um, uh, uh, um, detention uh, uh, um, having an element of deception? The objection in my submission is that, that, that it undermines foreseeability. And so that's the way in which I'm putting it, not, 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 not the, the sort of the other way around, effectively. Not, not. <coughs> that's obviously that the judge dealt with that by looking at conquer. And um, uh, and uh, I can't remember this, the um, Osama, I think it um, was um, Bizarro. Yes, sorry, um, Bizarro. Yes, I couldn't see it in my notes, but yes, Bizarro. Mm -hmm. Both of those cases, in our submission, in one sense, are used by the European Court as being examples of. Um, cases where 
arbitrariness was found. They're not um, uh, uh, purported to be, they're not identified by the European Court as being sort of indicative of the <coughs> existing circumstances. But even in Conquer, if one goes to Conquer, at, which is at um, tab, 10. tab 10, yeah, sorry, page 186, I think is the relevant passage starts. Conquer's the case where um, a group of asylum seekers were told that they needed to report to a police station to complete their asylum process, whereas in fact they were going to be detained. The, that, that, the, past, the, the sort of background is set out at page 186 <coughs> onwards. But the key reasoning is para 100 and, um, uh, uh, 188. And para, uh, uh, sorry, pa page 188, para 42. Yeah. And that's, I'll again let you read para, four, para 42 and then. I mean, the, refer I mean the, the reason I draw attention to that is probably obvious. Firstly, the court is talking about the need for reliability of communications. And then it refers to, which is not necessarily the same as bad faith, there being a conscious decision which has... Um, a conscious decision to mislead them in order to facilitate their expulsion. Deprive them of their li liberty. Conscious decision to mislead. Well, if you... Mr. Haddo, as I understand it, to, to use that, was aware clearly that, that, that in fact, the uh, appellant had come to uh, the end of it, uh, uh, rather had been recalled. He consciously says, though, good news, you've come to the end of your sentence. Now, that is a conscious decision. It, it, what, what his motives are... All right. Well, we've we've got your we've got your point. But my point is, it's it's beyond. You say it's the same as in Conquer, do you? Well, uh, or similar. Similar. I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's identical because it clearly isn't. Okay. And and, but my point, more importantly, in one sense, is it, it's an, it, 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 it's the language ultimately used by the European Court is not necessarily that of bad faith in the sense of there being bad faith tends to sort of carry with it. I could see it if the. If the, or if the body responsible for recall, if the Ministry of Justice sent him a letter that said, well done, you've come to the end of your licence, in order to encourage him to do something that would lead to him being in difficulty, to, d to mislead him into thinking something for some purpose. I can't think of a hypothetical example. You, you might be in the territory, but it seems to me you're a minimum who is simply a probation officer supervising his... his and, and he misunderstood and mis yeah. the law. Well, I'm not sure he misunderstood the law. In, in, I mean, Mr. Ha Mr. Haddo is... Um, I mean, firstly, Mr. Haddo is ultimately a public, a, a public authority um, for the purpose of the Human Rights Act. He clearly was carrying out a public function for the purpose of the Human Rights Act, whatever, however senior or junior yes, he was. But he wasn't carrying out the function of authorising detention or recall or he had implementing to apply, it. It, it, was, it, was, it was another department yeah. within the Secretary of State, I accept that, yeah. who was responsible for yeah. carrying out the, 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 yeah. the detention. But he, but he was still, as I say, a, a public authority. And, and, but more importantly, in one sense, what... I mean, I, I, the, the hypothetical my lady put to me with respect r raises quite, a, 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 in one sense, an important issue, which is that it suggests that if there's a degree of prejudice, it might have made a difference. Well, in one sense... It's not the prejudice, it's the deliberate deception. It's the using the procedure in a way it was not designed to be used. That's what's happening in, in uh, Conquer. Um, that's the misleading. It's... There, the law, the procedure is clear, it's laid down, but it's being used in a misleading way in order to achieve a different purpose. And that's 
a million miles away from this case. Well, that's really the point I was putting to you. But, but anyway, I, <coughs> you say it's similar, well, the, the, uh, and the there was a misleading. I, I mean, all I would say, and I, I, again, I'll move on, but, but is the focus of the European Court was on the reliability of communications. The fact of the matter is, what we can <coughs> point to is there was unreliability in com uh, uh, the, the communications from Mr. Haddo, whatever his status, yeah. were unreliable. And that, in one sense, was the purpose of that was, would appear to have been to, to, to sort of reassure the, the, the applicant that he'd done well. Um, that deals, uh, and, and Bozzano, and it, it, in my submission, doesn't take one very much further. It's, a, it, again, an example of a case, but it's not, um, I'm not going to take you to it. Um, the domestic cases earlier, in my submission, obviously, have been overtaken by Morgan. A number of the domestic cases quite clearly indicate that there is no, that, 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 that all one should look at is, is, is penalty. Um, I can take you to them, but I'm, it's probably not worth um, doing that. That really uh, probably is all I need to say in terms, I mean, we, I mean ultimately we say the, the way in which this sentence was, 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 was executed is, was not foreseeable. Um, I think I've identified the reasons. The one point I would make, and it, it, it in one sense links to the point that my Lord, Lord Justice Phillips has made to me, um, about uh, which is my Lord has indicated that um, uh, some of my submissions may sound like um, submissions based on legitimate expectation. We, I think, in our skeleton argument, highlighted the Nadaraja judgment, the well-known Nadaraja judgment mm -hmm. of... of, of um, Lord Justice Laws, uh, which is in, uh, the, in the authorities at tab 4, uh, page 75, paragraph 68, where he talks about the importance of public authorities dealing with individuals on a straightforward way, yeah. in a straightforward way. And, and that, in one sense, is, I accept is, is at the heart of what we say in relation to foreseeability, because we say it's not foreseeable that, that a public authority would effectively allow the misunderstanding, putting it at its lowest level, that, 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 that occurred in this case. In terms of the policy, yeah. because obviously the policy is... is Round three. Is, is, yeah. is, is, the policy is, is, is challenged as well. The policy, again, in our submission, is quite clearly concerned, whether or not I'm right about point one, the policy itself is quite clearly concerned with the execution of the sentence. It's, it's, yeah. it's concerned about uh, how the, um, uh, the power that clearly exists, because there clearly is a discretion to give the individual credit for the time that they were unlawfully at large, the way in which that um, uh, um, discretion should be executed. So it is concerned with the uh, execution of, 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 of the sentence, um, and it obviously is intended to um, give guidance as to how the clear discretion that arises. It's the discretion, I should say, for your court's note, arises under Section 49 of the Prison Act 1952, which is at tab one of the authorities bundle. And in one sense, there's not much I can say in the sense that ultimately I've identified the standards, yeah. the, the standards that one finds in Del Rio Prada about how uh, about foreseeability, uh, I've identified, say, the, the, the fact that those principles now are, uh, have been held to apply to um, execution of the sentence, and in our submission, there the, 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 the guidance isn't foreseeable about what credit one will get in these sorts of circumstances. It, it, it's very difficult to understand uh, um, uh, how a, a case like this will be approached, even though. Um, in one sense, if, 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 if the mistake was foreseeable, then the need to do the calculation is foreseeable. Um, um, uh, or the, the need to uh, 
consider what what approach should be exercised to, to discretion should be exercised is foreseeable. Um, but I'm not sure there's much else I can say yeah. because it's ultimately, um, I mean, the policy is clearly lacking in detail. And well, what should the policy say? I mean, the, the starting point is if you're unlawfully at large, then you go back and you serve the entirety of the sentence without any of the time spent at large counting. But the Secretary of State has a discretion in exceptional cases, which was exercised in this case, to discount. Um, or, or give credit for some of those days. Um, <coughs> what, what's, what's the policy what supposed to say? At the very least, <coughs> what the policy in my submission <coughs> could uh, uh, indicate, it is, it would appear, not least because of the case law, that it's foreseeable that um, people will uh, spend periods of, ta uh, 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 of time unlawfully at large when they believe... Uh, through, through no, no fault, fault of their, their own, own. Yeah. Um, when uh, they will believe they are serving their sentence. And it, it, it <coughs> there is an obvious relationship, potentially, between the period they, that they serve in inverted commas when they're not in fact serving uh, and the, the, the potential further period of detention they are liable for. And so, th the very least, one would expect the policy to say, um, where an individual has nominally served uh, the remainder of their sentence, they should get, I don't know, 50%. I mean, that, that's a matter, matter ultimately for the Secretary of State. But that's, you know, we're very conscious of the fact that if you think about how um, um, the sentencing guidelines work, if I remember rightly, um, but certainly how, for example, um, credit is given for time when somebody's on a tag before their sentence. There is a, a, effectively a mathematical <coughs> calculation taking account of the fact that someone has um, had a partial loss of liberty or, or been partially. And here, you've got a sim you, the person is 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 being treated believes they're serving their sentence. There is a, 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 it, it's it's not that difficult to say well. You know, if you if you if you served effectively the whole of your sentence, um, you should get fifty percent. You say served, you mean time has passed because he's not his liberty isn't interfered with. Well, it is to the extent that he's he's being required to remain in contact with his probation. Officer. But that's because of the second sentence. Well, it's not simply. It comes back to the fact that it's not. It is. It, it's served. treated. But it is in fact because of the second sentence. If he hadn't been sentenced to a suspended sentence with a curfew with a unpaid work requirement, there would not have been any continued supervision. The supervision had come to an end. Mr. Haddo recommences contact with him after the magistrates impose a suspended sentence. Well, of course, in one sense... Whatever he believes, it doesn't matter. That is the fact. Well, in one sense, the con contact would have had to re recommence anyway, but... but, but if that's the, I mean, in one sense, if that's the case, that's something you can still take account of. I mean, the, the policy would still. The point about the point is. Well, if you were on a, if you were on a tag for another sentence, you wouldn't get credit for the period on a tag for another sentence when the judge is imposing a sentence for the first offence, would you? Well, that's just no. not how it works. No. Unless my law tells me I'm wrong. No. No. But but <laughs> but my point. No. No, I'm not. I don't think you would either. But but but. <laughs> Um, my point, my point here is that that, that 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 and this is where the policy can be more precise. I mean, I, I, it's not for me to say whether it should be fifty. I, I use fifty percent as an example. <coughs> my point here is that you have a, a very foreseeable set of circumstances, which is contact being maintained, him being treated as though he was uh, uh, on license, the license coming to an end. Now. A, fa a second factor may be that he was on licence for another factor. That's something also ma which may be foreseeable. You can build into the policy, but it's not. It, 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 it is entirely foreseeable, effectively, that 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 that, that, that sort of a, a level of detail. <coughs> it's entirely possible to, to build in that level of detail, taking account of the fact that the individual. And the reality is here, you've got no indicator. I mean, the policy. The policy, it would have been entirely consistent with the policy for the Secretary of State to say, 
I'm giving you no credit, it would have been entirely consistent with the policy for the Secretary of State to say, well, I'll give you the 100%. Well, it can't be exercised capriciously. It's got to be exercised in a reasonable and rational manner. The discretion. Uh, of course, uh, uh, that's general public law. But my point, my point is that, 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 and this is where possibility comes into play, is that you, 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 the ECHR sets more a higher standard than, than public law reasonableness. It doesn't merely say the Secretary of State has to act reasonably, because otherwise we'd never have a problem with our law. Um, it, 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 re it requires effectively some indication of how this power, which is obviously of, of real importance to the prisoner, will be execute, uh, exercised. And the reason I gave the example of the, 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 of, of the spectrum was not to say it would have been lawful as a matter of public law for it to be um, for no credit to be given. That probably would have been unreasonable. But Um, Melody, I think that may cover everything. Uh, the, the one thing I've just had, uh, and and I am conscious of the fact that it is. I, I don't have someone. I have someone joining remotely for good reason, but 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 they're my instructions. Is that I'm told that the level of that the, the the way in which supervision operated did change in July, but I'm not. I don't have a reference for that, so I just need. Which goes to that point, so well, I need to look into that. Yes, I, I do okay. need to look into that. I mean, we've got some documents about um, supervision. Yes, we do. In the um, supplementary bundle. Yeah. Um. Well, the the what what we have, I think, is the is the is the documents from the. What we have, and this is where I drew attention to it, and it's, it goes back to the point I made before about the potential relevance of this. I'm not, I'm not sure it's 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 um, uh, it, it, I accepted this wasn't relevant to foreseeability, but if you look at, for example, uh, the supplementary bundle, page 180. This is the. This appears to be. This is the record of. Supervision. For the <coughs> sentencing question. And you see there. In particular, this is the reference to termination. Yeah. So you see there. That the, that the reference to uh, um, in July, because right, you can see 16th of July, the um, termination because the sentence expiry had reached. So <coughs> that, 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 that's evidence that effectively he was being treated as though he was still on license. So that's that's consistent with the point I was making, which is he was being treated effectively as though he's, he was serving two sentences. Page before, page one seven nine. Uh, sorry. Re requires him to attend an unpaid work appointment. That's for the other. That that's for the. I think that that's is after the, his yeah. sentence. Yeah, yeah, that's the other. Yeah. And that's when Mr. Heddo resumes contact. But but as I say, what one sees is that the in July. There is consistent with what 
Mr Haddo tells him there is it's recorded that effectively the sentence is And as I say, that, that's an indication in my submission that he is treated as being supervised for both. Anything else, uh, Mr. Sobby? Um, no, I think that's. Thank you. Thank you very much. Section 1 provides that any person um, who, having been sentenced to imprisonment, uh, is unlawfully at large, may be arrested by a constable without warrant and taken to the place in which he is required in accordance with law. The bail is reference to whatever it was that required his detention in the first place. Uh, here, the sentence of the Crown Court imposed in the night. Subsection 2 deals with the calculation of the sentence of a person who has been unlawfully at large. Uh, and we see that the primary rule is that where any person sentenced to imprisonment is unlawfully at large at any time during the period for which he is liable to be detained, uh, no account shall be taken in calculating the period for which he is liable to be detained of any time during which he is absent uh, from the place in which he is required in accordance with law. But that, that's, that's unlawfully the, at large. That's the primary rule. That time unlawfully at large is not taken into account in calculating the sentence. Of course, there are the words unless the Secretary of State otherwise directs. So there is a discretion to direct otherwise. But in the absence of any executive intervention, the primary rule applies. The next provision to look at again, in tab 2, page 6, is section 254. And as we've seen by subsection 1, where a prisoner has been released on licence under the provisions of chapter 6, the Secretary of State has power to revoke the licence and recall him to prison. And then subsection 6, upon revocation, the prisoner is liable to be detained in pursuance of his sentence, and if at large, is to be treated as being unlawfully at large. Now, as the judge observed at paragraph 10 of her judgment, the appellant does not challenge the Article 5 compatibility of the provision. Uh, there was initially a challenge to the legislative framework, uh, but that challenge was abandoned. The references your 
note during my skeleton argument below at paragraph 46. That's four bundle, tab 11, page 107. The absence of any challenge to the legislative framework is significant because it has four far-reaching effects. First, once a prisoner's license is revoked, he is automatically treated as unlawfully at large. Whether There's he no knows notification about it or not. Yeah. Uh, that's common ground. Secondly, the revocation of the license stops the clock on the calculation of the sentence. And that's because of subsection 6? Uh, yes, uh, and subsection uh, and section 49. Uh, 49 too, yeah. So, um, although there is a discretionary power in the Secretary of State to mitigate the full rigour of the rule, the primary rule is that the clock is stopped. Third, the prisoner immediately becomes and indefinitely remains liable to be detained so as to complete his sentence. That's the position of the statute. Uh, and fourthly, the authority for detention remains as it always was, the original sentence of imprisonment. It isn't any subsequent decision under section 49, subsection 2 of the Prison Act or otherwise. Uh, the circumstances in which a license may be revoked are not specified by the legislation. Uh, they are the subject of a recall policy, as my other friend has mentioned. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the recall policy identifies the circumstances which may lead to revocation or and breach of license conditions by reoffending. Uh, that spelled out to the appellant's own license. See the judgment below, paragraph 14, 18, that's in 24. I note in passing that the policy on recall and the recall decision itself are not challenged. So having looked at the legislation, may I turn back to the Supreme Court's decision in Morgan, yeah. tab 3, page 11. Uh, and the essential point I may make on Morgan is that it confirms at the highest level the pre-existing law. Uh, so we see in particular that paragraph 15, which I don't think my other friend showed you, that Lord Stevens makes reference to the Supreme Court's previous decision of wisdom where the Supreme Court held that if a custodial sentence has been imposed at the duration of the term of the sentence, the lawfulness of the prisoner's detention has been decided by the court in accordance with Article 5.1. And uh, Lord Stevens sets out paragraph 39 of Lord Newberger's judgment in that case. This does not appear to me to be a surprising result. Once a person has been lawfully sentenced by a competent court for a determinate term, he has been deprived of his liberty in the way permitted by Article 5.1a of the sentence term. Uh, and one can see how it follows that there can be no need for the lawfulness of his detention during the sentence period to be decided legally by the court. Now, Whiston itself was a decision about the recall to prison uh, of a prisoner on revocation of his license. And uh, I don't propose to take you to the detail of Whiston and Youngson, but one sees that sufficiently in paragraph 35 of Stephen's judgment in Morgan. If a prisoner is recalled to prison, then they are lawfully detained pursuant to their original sentence. See paragraph 15 above. Paragraph <coughs> 75. Stevens refers to the case of Khan, which, as you've heard from my friend, was the analogue 
challenge in England and Wales would be the Morgan challenge um, in Northern Ireland. It was Khan on which the judge below uh, particularly relied um, in her judgment at paragraph 65 to 69. Khan itself addresses W.O. Prada and significantly, for my purposes, Lord Stephen there points out that there was no suggestion in the Morgan case uh, that the decision of the Provisional Court in Khan was incorrect. And again, this all goes to the point that Morgan is confirming well established legal principles rather than doing anything novel. And the principle. <coughs> uh, paragraph 90, paragraphs 93 and 94, there is a helpful discussion of Del Rio Prada and why uh, the challenge in that case succeeded. Now, I should note this is in the context of Article 7, yeah. but as the court has seen, um, from another friend's submissions earlier this morning, and when he took you to Del Rio Prada, the reasoning of the Strasbourg Court in relation to Article 5 is essentially the same. And uh, it's helpfully summarised by Lord Stevens, paragraph 94, page 35. I consider that the decision of the court in Del Rio Prada was specifically geared to the facts of the case, which were described in the jointly passing sentence of the opinion of Judge Mahoney and Sir Hadder Rich has been quite extraordinary. In summary, uh, under Spanish law, the remission provisions had amended the sentence of the court, and thereafter, the application of the Parrot Doctrine has re retroactively increased the sentence. So that is the essential basis of the decision in Del Rio Prado. There has been a retrospective change to the sentence which formed the legal basis for um, the prisoner's pension. And that retrospective change that the Transfer Court was not foreseeable. Then at paragraphs 119 and following, Ed Stevens comes to consider the Article 5 challenge to the legislation in issue in Morgan's case. And you note, uh, unsurprisingly, by reference to Del Rio Prado in paragraph 120, that national law authorising detention has to meet the quality of law requirements, including foreseeability. Uh, in application. Now, the question with which Lord Stevens had to grapple in Morgan was did the national legal basis, the domestic legal regime relied upon to justify detention meet the standards of Article 5, the quality of law standards, notwithstanding that there had been a change in the legal regime? Uh, he held that it did for the reasons uh, given in paragraph 124 and following. And the first three of those reasons uh, confirm uh, and endorse the well-established domestic case law. That lawfulness of detention is decided in the whole sentence by the decision of the sentence of court, which will not have taken account of um, release or license. And then specifically in relation to foreseeability, uh, he says that it was foreseeable that arrangements for execution of the sentence might change. But what Lord Stevens is clearly not saying there is that it is necessary for the specific detail or timing of any changes to the re regime to be foreseeable. Uh, but in any event, as, as the court has observed at the course of argument, this was a case of a change to the domestic legal regime 
which justified that detention. And that is why foreseeability was a particular issue. Another case I ought to show you is Kakaris, which you haven't yet seen. It's tab 14, page 397. The facts are set out in, in the headnote. Uh, and if, if I might briefly summarise, what happened in this case was that the sentencing court had sentenced the prisoner to life imprisonment and had said, in terms, life means life. Upon his admission to prison, the prisoner was told by the prison authorities that he would be released after 20 years. Uh, and he'd been told that on the basis of some prison regulations, which were subsequently declared to be unconstitutional. So the reason why this case is particularly in point is that he was wrongly told yeah. by the administrative authorities he would be released after a certain period, and contrary to what uh, the law actually said. At paragraph 117 on page 447, the court begins its assessment uh, and it refers uh, in very familiar terms um, to the principles where the lawfulness of detention is at issue. The convention refers essentially to national law and lays down the obligation to conform to the substantive and procedural rules of national law. Uh, this primarily requires any arrest or detention to have a legal basis in domestic law, but also relates to the quality of law, uh, requiring it to be compatible with the rule of law and the inherent law of the convention. Of course, the quality of law requirements include foreseeability. Uh, over the page, under heading two, the court notes in paragraph, paragraph 119, it was common ground between the parties that the applicant was convicted in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law by a competent court, and it was article 5.1a of the convention. Uh, the question to be determined is whether the detention of the applicant after uh, 2002 conform to the original mandatory life sentence imposed on him. And the court notes at paragraph 120 and paragraph 120 in the final sentence that in imposing the life sentence, the limits on the size court made it plain that the applicant had been sentenced to life imprisonment for the remainder of his life as provided by the criminal code and not for a period of 20 years. And then paragraph 121, the court considers therefore that the fact that the applicant was subsequently given a notice by the prison authorities on the basis of the prison regulations in force at the time, setting a conditional release date, cannot and does not affect the sentence of life imprisonment passed by the limits of the size court, or render his decision beyond the above date unlawful. So this, in my submission, is a case squarely in point where a, uh, a communication of inaccurate information to the prisoner without bad faith, that did not amount to arbitrariness or undermine the requirement of foreseeability in our society. Uh, just lastly on the authorities, my other friend showed you the case of Chonka in tab 9. He showed you paragraph 42. Sorry, it's in tab 10. Chonka was the case where asylum seekers had been tricked into attending a police station uh, under the pretext that they could complete their asylum application, uh, but in fact it was uh, to the purpose of supporting them. Uh, and I just wanted to show you the final paragraph of uh, the final paragraph in 41, uh, just above paragraph 42. There is every reason to consider that while the wording of the notice was unfortunate, it was not the result of inadvertence. <coughs> On the contrary, it was chosen deliberately in order to secure the compliance of the largest possible number of visitors. At the hearing, counsel for the government referred in that connection to a little ruse at which the authorities had
of knowing the youth to ensure that the collective repatriation they have decided to arrange was successful. In my submission, it's nothing like the circumstances of this case. It is against that background that my learned friend's argument that the judge below erred in holding that the foreseeability requirement was met falls to be considered. And we see what the learned judge decided in <coughs> paragraphs 86 and following of her judgment. Uh, it's page 64 in tab 8 of the core bundle. <coughs> Turns to the question of arbitrariness. And I just note here the judge says that she has <coughs> rejected Mr. Grudzinski's, that's the then counsel for uh, the appellant, submission that for these purposes there is no material distinction between instances of bad faith and the unintentional communication of inaccurate information regarding the detention. Uh, nonetheless, I need to consider the significance of the fact that he was positively led to believe that the sentence was completed, in particular in light of the strategy requirement reasonable foreseeability. So, my other friends, but the appellant's first ground of appeal is that um, the learned judge treated the question of bad faith as dispositive. Yeah. The question of foreseeability with respect that's plainly wrong, we see from 86. Yeah. In paragraph 87, the judge noted that the authorities discussed by Thorfinn Kahn show that uh, disappointment of a prisoner's expectations as to how long they will spend in custody does not break the link between the sentence and detention. Uh, and that conclusion is uh, confirmed and endorsed by Lord Stevens in Morgan. He expressly gave as his third reason <laughs> holding that the policy of law requirements on that paragraph 26, that the prisoner's expectation of release did not affect the analysis that permanent sentences provided authority for detention throughout their term. Paragraph 88, uh, there is reference to Kafkaris, which I've just shown you. And then paragraph 89, her conclusion on foresee foreseeability was that the requirement of foreseeability was met because the claimant's detention in early 2021 uh, remained pursuant to the 30 month term of imprisonment, even if the particular manner in which he served this part of the sentence was not. Furthermore, the claimant knew that he had committed a further offence and thereby breached the terms of his licence and placed himself in jeopardy of the call. If one ma marks the judge's homework, as it were, by reference to the, the authority of Morgan, uh, that conclusion is, with respect, unimpeachable. At the time the appellant's licence was revoked, he had 174 days remaining on his sentence. The sentence of the Crown Court authorised his detention for those further 174 days. It was always foreseeable that if the appellant was released on license, uh, he might nonetheless have his license revoked and be required at any time thereafter to serve the remainder of his sentence. That's the effect of the primary rule in section 49, subsection 2 of the prison back, 1952. And uh, that was particularly foreseeable, if I can put it in that way, that if the appellant breached his license conditions by reoffending, The fact that he was innocently misled by his probation officer into expecting that his sentence would be completed in July 2022 does not mean that the recall to prison breached that any requirement of foreseeability in Article 5 of the Chief Cap Carlis. Now, there was a suggestion from another friend skeleton argument that the appellant's license conditions were somehow constrictive, uh, sorry, uh, restrictive, uh, such that they amounted to a deprivation of liberty, um, and that the period authorised by the sentencing court might somehow have been exceeded. That suggestion 
paragraph 36.g doesn't seem to have been pursued by my learned friend orally, uh, it, it's wrong. And just for your note, uh, the section 49.2 decision itself, uh, supplemental bundles, tab 3, pages 21 to 22, which a decision which is not challenged, which the government does as well, recorded that none of the license conditions imposed on the appellant um, impose a significant uh, restriction on his liberty. The appellant was separately under bail conditions of wearing an electronic tag and um, a curfew and a residence requirement, but those were bail conditions imposed by the Magistrate Court in December uh, 2019. Uh, the reference to that is uh, paragraph 26 of the judgment. judgment. That's an uncontroversial fact. We can have the online materials in the bundle. <coughs> One other point of fact that I should clarify is uh, in relation to the suggestion that the appellant continued to be supervised under the licence. Sorry, just before you do, so yes. the, the, ta the electronic tag would have come to an end when he was sentenced in March to the 24 months suspended sentence with only an unpaid work requirement. That certainly should have happened. I'm not sure if there's, I don't think there's specific evidence yeah. to that effect. But uh, the significance of the tag in fairness to the appellant, the significance of the tag is that upon revocation of his license, the police ought they to knew be where he to was. know exactly yes. where he it, was yes. at any time. Yeah. But of course, <coughs> uh, I'm not dealing today with a challenge to the police's yeah. failure yeah. to um, arrest the appellant for more than a year. <coughs> Can I ask you about the procedure, the, the, the procedure which deals with the detention of um, a prisoner in this case? You rightly say the authority derives from the sentence. On the face of it, that sentence ended on 2nd of July 2020. That on the face of it is when the authority to detain him would have expired. Annotation. That changes because of the recall. But the rules, as I understand it, the procedure does not require that the prisoner be notified of the recall. So this recall happens and he's in complete ignorance of it. Neither under the procedure is there any requirement that it be executed. Not only has it been made without him knowing, but it does not have to be executed at any time. The consequence of that is that he, unbeknown to him, on the face of it, his sentence has expired on the 2nd of July. Leave aside anything that's said by Mr. Haddock, but unknown to him, he remains a permanent at risk of detention without notice forevermore. Why isn't that arbitrary? By virtue of the procedure. Well, that is the effect of the primary legislation. And, and that's what we're engaged with. Well, the Under primary, the primary legislation's challenge. compatibility with Article 5 is not challenged. Mm. Not only that, but it was challenged, as I said, uh, and then the challenge was abandoned. Well, what about, what about the procedure? Is the procedure as regards notification of a recall and or the procedure by which it's effective, is that primary legislation? Or is that a matter of, or is that a matter of policy? The, the procedure is in a policy. Well, the, the, Do we the lack have of, the lack Do we of have any, the policy? Sorry. Sorry, we don't have we don't. the policy. But, but you can give it to us. Yes. 
the reason we don't have that policy is again that policy isn't challenged, isn't challenged and wasn't challenged below. And on the face, on the face of it, if if he hadn't been arrested in January twenty one, he'd be arrested for ten. Yes. Or ten years time. Why isn't that arbitrary? Well, uh, there was a distinct <laughs> argument which Mr. Brzezinski and below, and which hasn't been pursued on this appeal that after a certain lapse of time, there will be a break in the necessary causal chain between the sentence of the Crown Court and the detention. That with lapse of time, uh, there could develop an arbitrariness by, by force of the break in the chain of causation. And that argument was dismissed by the judge at paragraph 82. Mm. On the basis of an assessment of the specific circumstances of that case, uh, but of course I, I, I wouldn't seek to argue that no such argument could ever succeed on different facts. It was put to me below, I think it was at the submission stage before Mr Justice Lindley, what if it were 50 years later? Mm. And one can see that as time elapses, the strength of the breaking causation leading to arbitrariness increases. But for present purposes, the argument was um, dismissed by the judge, and there's no appeal against it. What, 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 is the, what is the justification for there not being a requirement in the policy to notify the prisoner that he has been recorded? Well, uh, what Lord Justice Simon Brown said in the case of S in 2003 was that uh, in many cases one wouldn't want to notify the they've absconded yeah. because of the absconsion risk. Yes, but it's the combination uh, of it's the combination of no notification and no requirement to execute means that means that they don't know about it. But they remain, un but they are thereby rendered <coughs> unlawfully at large. That's that's where the combination of the two results in this very unfortunate limbo, where they are, they believe they're serving their sentence, mm. but they're not, and remain indefinitely liable to um, subsequent detention. It does produce a very unfortunate, um, a very unfortunate situation which could be remedied by either by either by um, a requirement that the recall be executed within a, a specified time and or that in default of that at the very least the prisoner be notified. Yeah. Well wouldn't there be a isn't there a, a, a public law requirement on the Ministry of Justice to execute within a reasonable time and act promptly? Well um, there's a degree of complexity here in that under the, we've seen that under section 49.1, the person with the power to detain is the constable. Yes. So it's the police, not the Secretary of State for Justice, who arrest. So they uh, execute. They are, they are executing yeah. the decision. Under the policy, uh, there is a performance target. I'm just looking for the reference whereby the police aim to um, execute recalls mm. within a certain number of hours. And let me just find a reference to that. So yes, um, very grateful to my instruction system for reminding me. Paragraphs in tab 12 of the core bundle in the detailed grounds of resistance, paragraphs 15 to 18, the relevant policy provisions are set out. Sorry, can you give me the page number again? 121. 121, thank you very much. There's the point I just made about uh, section 49.1 of the, uh, the and then the police's responsibility for apprehending individuals before the prison is confirmed in the joint national protocol, which is a joint protocol between uh, the Ministry of Justice and the Association of Chief Police Officers. Uh, paragraph 16, page 122. 
the protocol exists precisely in order to ensure the early apprehension of offenders whose licenses go to state and revoke. The responsibilities of the probation service, which is the completion of various reports uh, and maintenance, the maintenance of the sensitive database of offenders whose licenses have been revoked by uh, GPPS, and that's a public protection uh, case work section, with quarterly updates of offenders. 96 hour hours. period, paragraph yes. 18. And that's it's, it's, it's 96 hours. So there is a policy to try to ensure that, um, that the recall to prison is affected swiftly. But under the legislation itself, there is no requirement either the person should be notified of his recall to prison uh, or as to any period of time in which that he, his recall should be detected. I suppose another point of the various chapters of accidents in this case is when this man appeared at the Medway Magistrates Court in March. Um, Crown Prosecution Service presumably were there. They would have access to a database relating to this man's status. And self-evidently, nothing was said. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a great interest to the magistrates to know um, that this man was subject of a recall. Rather relevant to this, sense. Yeah. Yeah. What's the point of the? To the extent that there is any evidence explaining this, how this sort of sorry tale developed, um, it does appear that the appellant may have fallen between two stools of the Metropolitan Police and the Kent Police. If you look in the supplementary bundle, in tab 8, beginning at page 94, this was a witness of um, Alex Babuto, a senior probation officer. Below. Paragraph 8. Babuto gives evidence of um, the data that was shared with the police as to offenders unlawfully at large. And explains that um, the claimant appeared in the versions of the database audit. This goes out quarterly to the police on three occasions July, October, and January 2021. And then paragraph 9 on page 97 the spreadsheet was provided to the police in the month before each audit was concluded. A column B was left blank for the police to complete and return. In the July 2020 audit, as the Met Police confirmed by return that the claimant was recall. In the October 2022 audit, uh, the Met Police raised a query about the claim and suggested it should be recorded as a Kent Police case. So that may be the explanation, but I'm obviously not here today to justify yeah. or to attempt to justify the failure of the police to um, meet their target of arresting the claimant within no, the of course you're not, but, but what you are, as I understand it, defending is the is the um, legal procedure which determines the detention of this um, appellant. And what we see is that, that procedure does not and did not enable him to know when, if, or when, he would be detained. And that there was uh, and that was due to that was due to the fact that there is no 
either um, uh, for either um, detaining him within a time of recall or otherwise notifying him if he had been recalled. And that seems to me a flaw in the system. Isn't it? If it is a flaw, it's a flaw in the legislation. Because uh, why can't it be dealt with by policy? Well. I've made my submissions on the effect of the primary legislation, which is clear and foreseeable on the face of the statute, that once your license is revoked, you are lawfully at large, and that time will not count, and you're liable indefinitely thereafter to be recalled to prison. That um, stark situation on the statute book is not the subject of an Article 5 challenge. <coughs> and so, <coughs> no, but how does operate is, is, is another matter. I mean, it, it doesn't need primary legislation for somebody to say if you recall somebody, you must execute it within a reasonable time or otherwise notify them. It doesn't that's the sort of primary legislation. It? So it's common sense, actually, given the effect of the legislation. I would accept it's common sense, but the fact that that uh, common sense somehow failed to be applied in the appellant's case does not make his detention Article 5 compliant. No, but the common sense isn't applied in any case because there is no requirement, there is no public, there is no requirement on public authorities to notify, to affect the recall within a reasonable time or otherwise to notify. And that's why we end up in this position. Yes. But at risk of repeating myself, I, I would say that the problem, if there be a problem, is with the legislation. And that's not challenged. Because ultimately, the question for the judge below, the question from the Lady of the Lords, is first, was the appellant's detention when he was recalled to prison in conformity with national law? Yes. And secondly, did national law meet the requirements of um, quality of law requirements of the uh, convention? Well, I see that would be the question, but that has to be taken as read that they do, because there's no, um, there's no challenge. There's no but, but the national the law includes both substantive and procedural. Yes, I accept that. And what's being put to you is that the there is no clear, concise, and foreseeable procedural law governing the way in which recall will be executed and how it will be notified. There's a policy that says we aim to do it within 96 hours, but there's nothing to notify the individual. There's no requirement to notify the There's individual. There's no requirement to notify. Um, and my answer to the point would remain the requirement of foreseeability is met, because if you go to your lawyer and ask, Am I um, liable to be detained to complete my sentence? The answer will be potentially yes at any time. Uh, if your license has been revoked, uh, you are liable to be detained to complete your sentence. Uh, and you need to find out whether your license has been revoked. Do you say that if somebody commits a further offence in breach of their license condition, they are on notice? PPC, whatever it's called. 
How do they find out? Uh, well, they, they could ask. Well, if they'd asked Mr. Haddo, he'd have said... Uh, well, it, <laughs> the, the evidence is not that Mr. Haddo was asked. No. Uh, the evidence is that Mr. Haddo... Uh, well, he was asked at a time when he didn't know. No decision yes. had yet been made. <coughs> he gave a truthful answer. <coughs> So if he'd been asked, you say he'd have... Well, it doesn't, well, I, I, I doesn't matter. <laughs> there was a point, before I turn to the policy ground, there was just a point on the factual piece which I wanted to pick up. Um, this was the suggestion that Continued to be supervised under the license after revocation. Uh, and I just wanted to show you Mr. Haddo's statement. I think we've, we've seen paragraph 12, but I haven't looked at paragraph 11, which is tab 6, page 32 of the supplementary bundle. and submissions. Firstly, in relation to the issue of TAG, um, I, I, I'd also been pointed out by my... Uh, been pointed to paragraph 26. Uh, that is the extent of the TAG. The point I was trying to make, and then we all sort of... I, I unfortunately took a took a sort of um, a, a, a sort a of suggestion term. from my Lord, which I probably, which I shouldn't have done. The a point I was making was the point my learning friend accepts, yes. which is it was easy to locate. Yes. And thinking about the dates, of course, the other point about that is my lady raised the issue of COVID. Certainly the start of the period was, in fact, before COVID. So COVID wasn't the explanation yeah. for the initial delay. Can I then deal, to, deal with the absence of the challenge to the legislative framework? I, I, I haven't, we haven't provided this to you, but we can. Um, the Supreme Court has made it clear, unsurprisingly, that challenges to legislation are different, are difficult. If I remember the case law, the, 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 the um, uh, latest state of the case law, it's a Northern Irish case called abortion services, uh, uh, safe zones or something along those lines. We can, as I say, I can provide the reference if it assists, where it talks about what it describes as abante challenges to legislation, in other words, challenges to legislation in, in the abstract in one sense. And it makes it clear to do that is a high threshold. You have to show that the legislation is incapable of being, exercise, of being exercised in a convention compliant manner in, in a large number of cases. Now, 
this is legislation which gives a discretion to recall. That's pretty much all it does. Um, it contains notice provisions following recall. Um, but it doesn't, for example, uh, prevent notification being given advance, uh, in advance. It doesn't say anything about how the, um, the, the, the recall should be exercised. That is dealt with in policy. And the policy itself, on the face of it, 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 it is difficult to challenge because of the fact the policy, if it had been applied here, wouldn't have caused these problems. Um, indeed, that's one of the reasons why we say it's not foreseeable. So that's why, in one sense, you end up challenging the, circ the, the individual um, circumstances, we say legitimately, because it's, the problem here is not the legislation. The problem here is not the policy. It is what happened in practice here. And that's why we say uh, execution, uh, that what is said in Morgan matters. Maloney Friends points to the fact that, um, as has been clearly established following Whiston, um, that in principle the period of detention is justified for Article 5 purposes um, for the whole of the period authorised by the sentence. But of course that one has to be a bit cautious about that, in, and this is where execution comes into play. If you had to give an example, if you, if you receive a 12-month prison service sentence and the legislation says you've got to be released at six months, in principle, you can be ordered to detain for the whole of the 12 months if you're properly recalled. But if the legislation provides for release and there's no basis for recall, but you're held to seven months, you're falsely imprisoned. And that's a breach of Article 5. So saying that the sentence uh, is justified for Article 5 purposes, uh, or the whole of the period of the sentence is justified for Article 5 purposes, in principle is correct. But one does need to look at, uh, at what happens in practice. And <coughs> that's where Morgan, in my submission, is so important. Because Maloney Friend says Morgan just restates what's well established. If you look, for example, at Khan, I wasn't going to take you to this, but, but it may be just worth, because it, it does demonstrate in one sense what, why how, thing, how, how Morgan does spread. I'll change the change. Um, <coughs> on at uh, page um, 115, para 122. In the context both of an Article 5 and, and an Article 7 are, <coughs> The uh, Divisional Court rejected my argument, in fact, that there is a distinction between um, the, the distinct, uh, the, 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 um, rather, there was no distinction between the sentence passed by the um, uh, uh, trial judge and the execution of the sentence. It goes on to look at foreseeability, but it, it, it the distinction in our submission that, 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 that Morgan now acknowledges, albeit finding on the facts there was no issue with foreseeability, is that execution does potentially uh, engage at Article 5 to the extent that at least, re least execution must comply with this requirement of foreseeability. And that, that, that but Lord Stephen says repeatedly that the distinction between measures con constituting a penalty and those constituting the execution or enforcement of a penalty remains. He, he confirms it. Sorry, if you Ma go to Parham Many times. Well, except it, he, he confirms it in the context... 94, the significant point is there was no erosion in principle of the well-established distinction between the penalty imposed and the means of its enforcement or execution. Sorry, that's in the context of Article 7. If you go back to 76, this is all in the consideration of Article 7. This is where I went to Para 121. 121. But that's about the qualitative requirement in respect of law for for the ex for the in relation to the execution the point i was making about calm mm -hmm.
was that Khan, sorry, I turned up, turned, turned up my page, was saying simply no distinction. Sorry, there is a distinct, there's a key distinction between, um, and this was in the context of Article Five. It doesn't doesn't distinguish sort of where this principle applies. There is no, there is a key distinction between the sentence passed and the administration or execution of the sentence. Um, Morgan, I mean, in one sense, it may not matter whether it changes Khan in any event, because Morgan clearly applies. What I, the point I need, I need um, is that for the purposes of Article 5, Para 121 is clear that there is a distinction between, that, that rather that there is a distinction between Article 7 and Article 5, and in the Article <coughs> 5 context, and obviously we're concerned with Article 5, yeah. that the, the requirements of quality of law apply to the execution of sentence. They don't apply in the context of Article 7, but they do in the article. Well, they may. They may, yes. Okay. And that's the... But what is, what is subject to it is the measure. Yeah. Measure will be subject to quality of requirements of law. Well, it's measures relating to, of course, may, may be a problem, I would submit is, a reflection of the fact that if you go back to Del Rio Prada, of course, what was being the, the language there was application. The application, the application has to be foreseeable. So, it, that well, a rule that changes the early release provisions, or some other measure that affects the uh, execution of a sentence. Well, I, I'm obviously not saying that a measure is out is not protected, but but the Del Rio Prada language which is what's being effectively applied here. If you remember going back to the passage I took you to in Del Rio Parda, talks about the application of measures. And, and in one sense, that's, one understands when one thinks about the facts of Del Rio Parda, why the, <coughs> the language of application makes sense. Because as I've indicated, the law, in one sense, the law never changed. All that, all that changed was the Supreme Court's interpretation of the law. So the, the the, the, it, 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 yeah, the way in which the law was applied. The way in which the law was was applied. Changed. And and here but it was talking still about a law. It. it was still a measure. Well, here, I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, here. Well, I, I, well I, I'm risking going around. This, I mean, what we would say is is, is that there was a law. Um, the, the legislation provided potentially for recall. Um, its application, though, was what was not foreseeable by the time of and that's I mean, and in one sense, I mean, one of the reasons I mean, the only reason in one sense for pointing to this that, that Morgan is as being a change as opposed to simply restating principles because whatever else nobody's disputing the fact that obviously you have to apply um, Morgan it's simply because it demonstrates in one sense the judge things have moved on from the judge the, I mean the judge understandably in one sense focused on um, uh, the sentence but, but things have moved on um, and I just ask looking at paragraph 121 of Morgan the last yeah. sentence and we've been looking at the word measures. I mean, to, to get this case within that, we'd have to replace measures with administrative incompetence. Wouldn't we? Well, that's why, in one sense, I go back to I, 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 I mean, a couple of things. Firstly, I, I, I've, I've argued about what the extent to which it's just simply administrative incompetence. It's the... Um, You, give it, you, you don't delay what Mr. Haddo said and the policy about notification. Those are the three limbs. Of yes, it. yes. It, it, it was. It was. It was. It, I'd focus more on foreseeability. But, 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 but secondly, Morgan. The key principle in my submission that, 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 as I say, we take from Morgan, is that foreseeability is. 
correctly applied effectively in Del Rio Prada, and it was applied to execution. And that means one can look at the um, uh, language of Del Rio Prada. And Del Rio Prada uses the language which perhaps more naturally fits with the circumstances of this case, uh, where it starts the, asking the question, the court must examine whether the law authorizing the continued detention was sufficiently foreseeable in its application. And that does fit. More. Hold on. Whether the law authorizing detention is sufficiently foreseeable in its application. Yes. I well, just miss, it missed it out is. the date from the, that sentence because obviously that date doesn't <laughs> apply in this case. But that's the, that's, exactly, that's the exact language of the first sentence of para 130 of Del Rio Prada. And, and an answer may be, as at the date of sentence, he knows full well that if he commits a further offence in breach of his licence conditions, he is liable to recall, and that liability to recall is indefinite. But he also knows... That's why the next sentence, which talks about foreseeability throughout, and that's why execution is... And the fact it applies to execution is... Because, I mean, ultimately, the, the question... Because it's focused on detention, the question is, at the point of detention, was this foreseeable? And by that stage, a whole load of further developments have occurred. Can I, a couple of other, perhaps, more minor points, just in terms of the facts. Firstly, Malone and Friend focused on my submission 36G yeah. of the skeleton argument. I, I, <laughs> My language may not have been ideal. The point I was trying to make there, and, and I, I do stand by, is that, of course, when you're on licence, there is a restriction on your freedom to use a non-technical Article 5 language. That's recognised by Lord Bingham, for example, in West, and that's what effectively occurred in this case. That, that's the point I'm trying the to make. the sword of Damocles hanging over. Yes, yes, that's, that's the point. It's, it's not unrestricted liberty of the sort that we all enjoy. Um, um, Malone Friend suggested that, that, that um, uh, uh, raised the question that was raised by um, the court about effectively what would have happened if, if um, a lawyer had been asked and the lawyer would have potentially said contact the probation service. Uh, Maloney and Friends said, well, and in this case, there was no question asked of Mr. Haddo. The only point I'd say is, to say to, in circumstances where Mr. Haddo said what he said, it's a bit unrealistic in one sense to expect the, the applicant to say, go back and say, are you really telling me, is that, are you really sure that's the truth? Which in one, and of course, Mr. Haddo is the immediate point of contact. From the, I mean, he, he may be junior, but he's the person who is the point of contact for the purposes of supervision. And so it, it, to, to say effectively, you should have gone back and said, is this true? In my submission, that's a little unrealistic, but I'm not sure that a huge amount necessarily no. changes on that. No. It turns on that. Turning finally to the, the sort of this issue again, which my Lord Lord, uh, Lord Justice Phillips has raised about, about sort of length of period of time. In our submission, it is right for the court to feel sort of instinctively uncomfortable about the potential for someone to be at risk of recall for a lengthy period of time. Um, instinctively, because of the legitimate expectation case law I refer, referred to, Nadaraja, about people dealing, be, being dealt with in a straightforward manner. Um, one should uh, be able, effectively, to um, rely on the bits and pieces of information one receives from the authorities and believe that you can move on with your life. Um, how does that fit in? We've tried to fit it in in the way that we um, uh, 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 saw best from an Article 5 point of view. Ultimately, though, as James makes clear, uh, Strasbourg hasn't sought to sort of set out a comprehensive um, uh, uh, 
set of rules that determine when the quality of law question is complied with and when it's violated. And ultimately, one shouldn't lose sight of that discomfort, effectively, that the court may have about what happened in this case. The reality is that uh, there was, in the form of the policy, something that was intended to ensure that um, prompt action occurred. That's something the, 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 the applicant would have been, <coughs> could have been aware of. Um, and that didn't happen. And he was allowed to get on with his life. Can I just check that yes. there's no... Um, I'm going to assume, in the absence of, in, 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 on the basis of silence, that those virtues behind me have nothing more to add. So. Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Savvy. Well, thank you both uh, very much for those um, clear and succinct submissions. Uh, we will be reserving our judgments. Uh, they will be handed down in the usual way for typographical, typographical corrections, uh, omissions, and matters of that kind, but not for re-argument of the case, as I know you are both aware. Um, can I remind you, uh, as I'm required to do, of the uh, importance of the embargo? Um, the judgment shouldn't be distributed beyond the closed list that is identified. And we will hope that you will be able to agree any consequential order without the need for attendance. Um, but if there are points that require <coughs> uh, decisions, they can be dealt with in writing. Anything else? Thank you both very much.